stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. I'm going to be Bradshaw. That will be the WWE Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's maybe favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we have got one of the greatest legends of all time. He ran one of the greatest, most iconic territories. He's in every Hall of Fame that there is a Hall of Fame. He's Mr. Bill Watts, one of the greatest figures in wrestling history, and we're honored to have him. Mr. Watts, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. It's, it's my pleasure. I, I don't do these much anymore, but when Gerald asked me, good gosh, we've been friends forever. And of course, Jack and I, I met Jack when he was a senior in high school. And I was talking to Gerald. I met him when he was in the eighth grade, you know? So <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, do you remember that story when you met me, you come to Stillwater, I think to get drunk and then beat up some cowboys there. And you, 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 <laughs> you, you and Jack were already friends. How did you and Jack become friends? But anyway, you woke was... me up in the middle of the night, trying to kick me out of my own damn bed. That's right. <laughs> Well, he was he 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 had met my brother Bob, and Bob Bobby. Bob was all state, right. and he and Jack were running around together, and that's how I met Jack was through Bobby. I, but, I remember you know, Bobby. Bobby came up to me at a bar one time in Stillwater at, at Oklahoma State, and they introduced himself. He said, "I know who you are. You're Briscoe." He said, "You and I have the same problem." He said, "Usually <laughs> when a, when a guy comes up to you in a bar and asks you if you're." If you're a watch or a Briscoe, you either had to fight them or they were going to buy, buy you a beer. <laughs> That's exactly and right. And Bobby was so damn big, I said, well, are you going to buy me a beer, I hope? <laughs> well, you know, when I was, I'd gone up to play with the Minnesota Vikings. And and they we were in the training camp in Bemidji. And uh, they wanted me to stay, but they wouldn't let me wrestle in the offseason. And there was no players association then, so they could control you. Why well, heck my contract with the Vikings way back then was eight thousand wow. dollars. I was already making a hundred grand a year wrestling and just getting started. And uh, so I left. And of course, on the way home, every place the plane stopped, I got a pint of scotch. So I got off in Tulsa because I just decided I'd go see Fred Williams. Well, it was coaches weekend and Abel and Williams were there. By the time they got to Fred's barbecue place where I was meeting them. The, ca the cab driver was crying because I was forcing bar barbecue down, he down his mouth. <laughs> and they tried to talk me into going and have a nap, and I wouldn't do it. We end up in the bar, and the whole Oklahoma State football staff is there. And Bobby's coach were talking and all that. I'm buying him drinks. But then all of a sudden, I was out, and I took his drink. He was in the bathroom and drank it. Come back, where's my drink? I said, I drank it. And I was getting ready to say, but I ordered you another. He said, you're going to buy me another one, or I'm going to whip your ass. <laughs> Make a long story short, he got the short end of that deal real quick. And Bobby didn't even know it. So Bobby sees him the next day with a fat lip and some teeth missing. And he says, you've been in a fight, coach? And they kicked Bobby off the football team. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, it was, there was, all, there was always, you know, it's so funny. Here I'm at this age, I'm 83. And Jerry, as you know, for the last four to five months, I, I got the worst strain of COVID and viral pneumonia, and I've really fought for my life. I've been in the hospital five times. And, you know, you're so weak, and all you're going to talk about is your damn health. And I think, what a miserable thing. When, you know, uh, boy, did we raise some cane and, and do some things. And we didn't ever even consider getting old because we didn't even know what it was. You know? Didn't think we were going to get there either. It ain't, yeah, it's, there's not much good about it. It's not for wussies, that's for sure. Yeah. And so we yeah. have so many dear, dear friends, you know, that sometimes you're having a dream and you're back with them and we're wrestling somewhere or talking somewhere or, or we're doing something that's like, just like it's real. And then all you wake up and say, my gosh, that was a ghost. Yeah. That was a yeah. ghost. And, it, it, so, it, tell us a little bit, uh, Bill, you know, uh, about, you know, you, you, you played football at, at OU, you were a wrestler and you're football, but you had some, uh, you had a, a, a teammate there and also that became a professional wrestler, Edward McDaniels, who became Wahoo McDaniels. Was you there when all those stories were developing about Wahoo, when he ran that marathon? Can you kind of fill us in on, on a sure. six pack of beer and all that? Yeah, Chief was a, uh... He was a hell of a guy. Matter of fact, he was from Midland, Texas. We didn't know that the one the, the one of the guys on their team was his dad was a pharmacist. And he had Wahoo come by the day of the game to get a B12 shot each time. 
And of course the B12 shot was, was, wasn't B12. They gave him <laughs> B12 too. Yeah. And Wahoo would gain all these yards. And he finally figured out the guy's shooting him with speed. <laughs> and so anyway, the Wahoo was already doing it, you know, but he got, Wahoo was a guy that he'd give you the shirt off his back. And he was just a hell of a guy. Yeah, I was there and I was there when he ran that. He It was going that they told him Port had run from Norman to Chickasha. He said, anything Port did, I can do. And he did. Now, Port was Robertson nobody... was, was the football uh, wrestling coach at the wrestling time. Wrestling coach, right? Port Robertson. Yeah. yeah, and so, and Port was so strict. Yeah. But anyway, uh, so Wahoo did, but nobody realized Wahoo was taking speed all the way. <laughs> they had a big crowd, and pretty soon the cameras are following him and everything else, you know, but he ran it. And I'll never forget one time he came up the wrestling room and he tackled Port from behind huh. and had him down and Port reversed him and started put and he Port blows trying to pull himself off the mat. And Port's got the fat around his waist and was pulling by the fat while he was begging and screaming. <laughs> it, was so, it was so funny. Who who was that the hundred and forty pounder, Delgado or something like that that uh, that took Wahoo down about ten hundred and forty pounder and Wahoo, Wahoo coming in? Delgado was hundred and twenty three pounder. Yeah, twenty three pounder. But I heard the story where Wahoo would I can you know why these rats are a big deal because OU at that time had pretty salty rats and team with Port Robinson. Yeah. Wahoo would you know these wrestlers, you know, blah blah blah. And when somebody I believe it was Goodner, your old friend Goodner, George Goodner that invited him into the wrestling room to see. Wahoo over there is a hundred and twenty-three pounder. If you can take him, you know, you can you can join our workout there. Oh man, honey, you know, Wahoo, blah, blah, blah. I can do that. And uh, Delgado beat the holy crap out of Wahoo, went running out of the dressing. You cries are crazy. I never come back in this room again. <laughs> well, he came up there once and jumped me. And I was so tickled. I was laughing so hard that actually he he, he tackled me and I went down, but then I reversed him. And I never used a figure four or a guillotine. But with him, I did. Yeah. And I said, now I'm going to crank you out. And Tommy Evans pulled me off of it. He was already screaming. And I said, you know, well, he was just a character. He was of an alter. You know, but Delgado came to me one time. And he said, are you, when are you going to be ready to learn how to wrestle? And I said, what do you mean? He said, you don't do any, you don't use your leverage. You don't use anything right. He said, you need to learn. He said, I'm going to work out with you. I said, you're too little. He said, if you don't lose your weight, you can't hold me down. I said, you're crazy. I can hold you down one arm. Guess what? He came out. <laughs> then he said, if you don't use a stand-up, you can't get away. I said, you're nuts. I couldn't. That's how good that little fart was. He was three-time national or two-time national champion, and he had such endurance. When, when you'd go to the joints, and the dances, he did, he danced with every girl there. He danced every song, everything. It was like a workout for him. But yeah, but anyway, while he was in town, he was playing pro ball. Then he was already wrestling in the, in the off season. And we were at a bar and he wanted to cash a check. And this was 1962. And back then, the economics professors said, if you were making 25000 a year, you were wealthy. That's how the difference in money. A new car costs less than $2,000. So the bottom line, while we have this $4,000 check, I said, what's that for? He said, for wrestling. I said, for a month? He said, no. I said, a week? He said, no. I said, what? He said, one match. I said, hell, who do I have to kill? I can beat you in 90 seconds. <laughs> and he said, I tell you, you need to get in this business. So as Wahoo got me in, and then Dale Lewis was wrestling there, and Dale and I and a guy named Bob Griffin, who was a former All-Pro and an All-American from Arkansas, was a defensive coach at the Indianapolis Warriors, which was a farm team in the World Football League. And so he moved in with us, and I played football while I was breaking in with uh, into pro wrestling in Indianapolis, Indiana. Who, who, who was the one that broke in? Well, I was the one that got me started oh, oh, and, yeah. and got me there. And then, of course, I had Dale Lewis was living there. Remember, Dale was a two-time yeah. NCAA yeah. champion, and he and I lived with him. He gave me my tights and my shoes. And, and as a matter of fact, Dale Jerry died in at the at the Leukemia Hospital in Norman. I didn't even know he was sick. Wow, I thought he was in Washington or somewhere like he that. He was, uh -huh. but he got leukemia, 
and I didn't even know he was sick. I feel so bad about that. Dell Dell was a great amateur wrestler, and he's one of those guys that you know would had the size and had everything had to had to look, but he just he just couldn't put two and two. He, and just like his college career, he was the most boring guy on the mat in college. <laughs> yeah, him, him him and Ted Ellis would go one to one ever 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 match. I don't think Dell ever got a take that while well, he's well. At least at least Ellis would shoot one. Dale would even shoot yeah, one. Yeah, Dale would. Yeah. I that's when, that's good... when you guys practice the back to the line there. You know, you guys had that center <laughs> style, you know, you back to the line all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Goodner, I remember Goodner one time turned his back on him. Dale said, are you quitting? He said, no, I just want to see if you got enough guts to shoot a takedown when I'm not looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> so Walt Goodner. was the one that wanted to talk you into it. So you started up there, uh, you were playing for the Vikings and you were, you were just started. No, I over. was playing this. I was playing with the Indianapolis Warriors okay. in Indianapolis when I broke in, because he sent me up and the booker for Barnett was a guy named Balk Estes, who is another guy from Oklahoma that was in pro wrestling that I had never heard of. And, you know, there's a lot of great guys from Oklahoma that have done well in pro wrestling. Dick Hutton was a, was a, he was an NWA world's champion. Three, three time national champion. Well, Ganya, Ganya did something I never heard of. Ganya got a timeout because he's exhausted during their match when Hutton was a freshman and Ganya referee's decision, even the national. Yeah, with a timeout. You know, John, yeah. when you when you when you go go to a referee's decision, you run matches were nine minutes back in those days. That's so you right. You wrestled nine minutes, then you had uh, an overtime. You went you went two two minute period or two three minutes. I don't, I don't whatever remember. it was. They had wrestled like thirty minutes, and Ganya had actually called for a timeout. And if it's tied after 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 the, uh, the time limit expires and and regulation back in those days. It was up to one guy, the on mat referee, and Gandhi had asked for a timeout, so he had blown up during the match, and and the referee makes a sole decision on on aggressiveness and stuff like that. He awarded <laughs> Gandhi the national championship because OSU was winning so many titles that they were trying to stop the streak at that time. And, well, yeah, and you know, you know, Byrne was a tough guy though. Byrne was an All American football player, and he late, he also wrestled on the Olympic team. And Mad Dog Vachon was on the Olympic team for Canada that same Olympic. Canada. Uh, yeah, wow. you know, so it was an interesting, interesting group of guys. And there was some tough son of a guns in wrestling. They didn't want anybody that had any background because they didn't think they could control you. And uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but, but a few snuck in. <laughs> yeah. And of course, so, so you, 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 yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. So I was going to I was going to ask you about about your time in Minnesota there or Indianapolis. Is that the team that told you you couldn't do both sports? No, or? no, it was the it was a, a, a Minneapolis or Minnesota was the expansion team in the NFL, and Norm Van Brocken was the coach. And Norm Gagne Van got me, That's Gagne what we're got talking me about, to go John. up there, and 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 get on that on the team for a workout, and I was there for a week or two. And uh, I had a good time there. Matter of fact, Van Brocklin, they do the grass drill, and I'd jump on somebody and pick them up and body slam them. Yeah. And Van wow. Brocklin, who was so strict and went nuts, he liked it, and he called me Smokey the Bear, and he'd get tickled when I'd slam somebody. Yeah. But, but John, there was some... John and I were talking a little bit earlier before we came on about, you know, when, 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 when you, uh, you transition into pro and, and, and pro wrestling. You were told uh, you were told uh, when you were getting recruited, actually, by Bud Wilkinson, and that was in the days when you know, everybody was copying Bear Bryant because he had those those smaller linemen and that were do all that scramble blocking and and all that scrambling and everything. They were they they asked you to drop how many how many pounds that come down. Well, they, yeah, you're 100 percent right. What they really got to know you was J.D. Roberts had won all these awards as a lineman, and he was about 190 pounds. So they started thinking everybody had to be small and quick and kids were changing. They were starting to grow. I was 245 and they made me be on every fat man's team and all this crap. And I was really a year too young. If they, if they'd have been smart back then, they didn't know it. If I could have red shirted, because I was, I was advanced in school and I could do the schoolwork. I was on the Dean's honor roll several times, but the bottom line is I really was even more immature probably than I am now which was horrible. I mean, and so I, and then they still all use the teardown system. 
And the teardown system never worked much for me. Matter of fact, if you tore me down too much and touched me, your lights went out. And so that's what happened when he was with the Houston Oilers. The coach went to sleep. So anyway, you know, it was a crazy time. I, I've often said I was so down on myself. If I hadn't had a chance at a different career and then excelled at it, I would have been labeled a failure to me. And that's with Bear Bryant. Bear Bryant took 75 kids off campus and 50 of them quit. And they came out with a 25 and they talked about how great it is. I, I said, that's not great. He decimated and destroyed the hearts of 50 kids on an off-campus boot camp that should never have been sanctioned because you shouldn't be able to tear down. And that's like the Cutchins guys did at OSU. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was during my era there. Yeah. So you know how bad that was. Yeah. They destroyed OSU. Yeah, there, there were 100 and some kids out for football. Phil Cutchin was, was an, uh, a Bear Bryant disciple. He was part of that. I think it was A&M where he, uh, he had that boot camp. All, all that's for, right. All, that's all right. Texas, Texas A&M. And so we each tried, but Cutchin tried the same thing at, at, uh, at OSU. There were 105 kids that I think they ended up that year were like, like 60 kids ended up on the team. <laughs> but they had 60 kids that was in shape. Though, I'll tell you that. Yeah, well, that's true, but you can do it without tearing everybody down. You know, tear down is a, is a motivator. It's fast, but it's not lasting. Uh, positive is a, longer lasting one because it's not it's not tearing you down it's, it's like wayne bachman tells me how many times he heard the coaches talking about my potential i said gee none of them ever told me about it. and jd roberts all he ever did to me was tear me down and it's what we were doing a bull in the ring one time and he stopped it and he said he said uh, watch he said we hear you're a pretty good fighter in the street but you don't have the right stance. You know, if you and I squared off and I got down the hitting stance, what would you do? And I said, I'd kick your head off your fucking shoulders. <laughs> and the guys all started laughing. He said, what'd you say? I said, coach, you wouldn't get it unless it happened. <laughs> yeah. so, it was, so, how, it was just, so how did the Houston coach go to sleep? <laughs> well, they get this stuff going. And somehow then I just, I get the shaking. And I, if I'm, I think I'm going to fall down, so I hit him. So you hit the Houston Oiler coach? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's times that people got to go to sleep. <laughs> the old dirt, the old dirt nap, we used to call it. <laughs> well, you know, you can do a lot of things with me. It just You're just putting your hands on me. It's the wrong thing. You know, it, it's just doesn't isn't work. That isn't that detrimental to your pro football career? I got fired. <laughs> <laughs> they sent an assistant to pick up the playbook. <laughs> who, who picked up the coach? <laughs> I have no idea. You know, that's so long ago. He was a prick. You know, he was a prick. He, uh, he didn't last a, another year there and they replaced him. And some of the guys who quit because he was such a prick, they brought him back and they played there. They played several years. There were a bunch of great guys around there. The, the Hogan, United, Wharton was, Hogan Wharton was already wrestling, wrestling professionally down there. And, of course, I hadn't started yet. The United Football League, that, that was what you were in, in in Indianapolis, right? That could have been it. Hell, I don't remember. Yeah. I was just looking uh, it up about different because I, I looked up the AFL, which merged, obviously, with the NFL. So I, was in the, I was in the second year of the AFL. You know who was making the most money in pro football then? Billy Cannon, who was a Heisman Trophy winner at LSU, right, and he was making one hundred and twenty thousand a year. That was the biggest pay in the whole league. And then the next biggest signing was when they got in the fight over the NFL and the AFL over Joe Namath, and the Jets signed him, and they signed him for over four hundred thousand dollars. And Wahoo and I were in in the Madison Square Garden when it happened, and Wahoo said, "That's crazy. Nobody makes that kind of money in pro football." <laughs> he was uh, Wahoo uh, was playing for the Jets also, wasn't he, at that time? Yeah, Wahoo went down with the Texans first, but he was taking speed to practice, and he, and he passed out. <laughs> so then, so, then I think he went to San Diego or somewhere, <laughs> came back, and then he he, he, he he went to Denver, and then with the Jets. He was a hell of a middle linebacker uh, against the run. He was, he was a hell of a ball player. 
And how did how did Wahoo transition first transition into professional wrestling? You know, I don't know who got him in it. To tell you the truth, I don't know because Hodge was already wrestling, and by the time I got in, Dale Lewis was wrestling, and uh, Jack was always telling me to go. I need to go in wrestling, and I I never even watched the match. You know, uh, uh, and then Roderick in recruiting would tell the heavyweights he could get them in wrestling. That, that's why Jack left uh, Bud Wilkinson after he signed that letter of intent and went went with uh, uh, okay. uh, Myron over at Oakley because Myron had done his research. Myron was a sharp guy, as you he know. Was. And, and he was. And he'd find out what the guys liked and everything. He found out Jack loved professional wrestling and wanted to be a pro wrestler like, like Danny Hodge. So, of course, Leroy McGurk, who was a promoter right. there, and Leroy was a uh, Oklahoma State national champion. So, Myron, Myron contacted Leroy, and Leroy called Jack. Jack, I know you signed with OU to play football, and we're really proud of you, but I guarantee you, if you'll go to Oklahoma State wrestle and you win a national championship, I'll make you a pro wrestler. And that day, he told Bud to stick it and, and wrote it all. The only time I really talked to Bud was when he came to my house to recruit me. Then he never talked to me until years later, he ran into each other in Chicago airport, and I was already a big star. And he said, Bill, we made a mistake for you. And I said, you're a little fucking late. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? little. But anyway, but yeah, Roderick, I should have gone to OSU to tell you yeah. the truth. Yeah. Because Roderick was the kind of guy that would have got it out of me. Uh, Port wasn't and Tommy Evans wasn't. Tommy was a nice guy, but he wasn't a motivator. So if he wasn't a weight where he could work out with you every day, you just didn't benefit. And so... Uh, Roderick and also the OSU football pro would be more to my style and that I was growing. Remember, I was in a car train wreck right. and when I and I was unconscious off and on for two right. weeks. They thought I'd die, they'd never walk again, never play football again. And that's the doctor's diagnosis, but God does the prognosis. And I got on, and then a guy named Lynn Hickey that played at Bethany High School went in the Marine Corps at 138 pounds and came out at 218 from lifting weights. And he and Jay Clayton, who Jay Smith, started lifting, and they talked me into come lifting with them. I said, the coaches won't let us lift. They forbid it because they were so dumb. Right. Yeah. They thought it made you muscle-bound because they'd seen bodybuilders with these great bodies but were not well-coordinated. But that's because they hadn't done anything to be coordinated. Right. And so anyway, I started working out with Lynn and Jay, and I was 245. I'd gotten well. And seven months later, I weighed 310 pounds and was wow. Superman. And I'm telling you, it was it was one of those things. That was a God thing. Even though I was in total rebellion to God during those years, I call them the, my desert years, which I was like Moses. I was in the <laughs> <Yeah>. desert. <laughs> he was in the desert. But you, you were know, the God, big... God is faithful even when you're not. Uh, yeah. You, you were probably the biggest guy that I'd met because, I'd like I said, we met when I was in the ninth grade and you tried to kick me out of my own bed. But... Uh, I remember waking up and I remember, holy cow, who was this big son of bitch laying in bed? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I didn't, ask, I didn't ask you to leave. I just asked you to snuggle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I would have left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, had oh, no cho- I had no choice in the matter either. <laughs> oh, God, we had some times, didn't we? Yeah, Bill, there, there was an old bar out there. I've told, told John about it. It was an old, 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 because Cushing and, uh, was right next door, and I was a little redneck town next to Stillwater that had these redneck bars out, man. If you went to this bar, you didn't go out there to get drunk. You went out there to get in a fight. And Bill <laughs> and my brother went out there, and there were three of these old well workers, man. They were looking for something to, you know, Jack and Bill's big college stars, and they, I guess they started harassing you guys. You ended up tearing the guy's car out with his own body, I believe. <laughs> well, the, there was an Indian that was named Two Guns. And I said, Two Guns, you keep screwing with me, I'm going to put you in the happy hunting ground. <laughs> and anyway, he went outside. I hit him, and then I hit him so hard, he went over the hood of the car. And I had his cowboy hat on when I come back in. <laughs> and the bouncer then was hustling to my date that night. And I went up to him. I said, get her phone number, call her later. I'm the one buying the beer. She's mine tonight. <laughs> and he dropped the shoulder on me and I popped him. So he's laying there out. And then 
the owner's coming toward me, and Jack said, Bill, he's got a blackjack. <laughs> I turned to him. I said, I hope what you got is chocolate because it's going to go internal. I'm going to shove it up your ass. And he threw the blackjack over behind the bar. And Jack and I used to make those bartenders give us a case of beer to leave. Yeah, you guys had the cheaper. You guys had the cheaper drunk in town. John, they'd walk into a bar, the bartender would slide a case of beer on on a bar and said, "Guys, enjoy the beer, but enjoy it someplace else." You That's right. Beer. <laughs> oh yeah, it was all. You know, we we had an established thing there that worked pretty. You know, the funny. I was thinking, you and I got to talking earlier. There's so many great stories, but I remember Bo Diddley was playing at the student union, and I was there, and I was sitting at the table with Jack. And I'm just, I'm gone. And so I got up and I went up on the stage with Bo Diddley was saying, and I took the microphone away. <laughs> so it's getting a little rowdy. And I said, Boomer Sooner and F you Aggies. <laughs> and I said it a couple of times. And all of a sudden, here comes old Frank Parker and Gary Kutzinger. They're two All-American yeah. football players. They come up to the stage. They're looking up at me. I said, what do you two want? <laughs> they said, oh, Bill, we just want to buy you a drink. And Jack <laughs> fell out of his chair. Jack was laughing so hard, he fell out of his chair on the floor. <laughs> and he was the only one in the room that would have had a chance because the others sure did. And they didn't, and they didn't want to pay the price. But we had some good times. How did you I, know I, went, back out to that, I went back out to that bingo there another time. Everybody in there was holding the door shut. I couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't get it. How did you and Jack become such a good friend? Was it through Bobby or, or did, did Yeah, it was through Bobby and then Jack kept telling me I need to get in pro wrestling. I'd never even watched a match. And uh and so I don't remember, but we would run into each other and there were just you know, some with some people it's just a natural affinity. It's right. kinda of like Bruno San Martino, who I worked with a couple of years. I didn't see him but two or three more times the rest the whole rest of my career. But it didn't make any difference. I knew who he was. Right. It was these were not high maintenance friendships. They were, they were friendships that you knew were a friendship. Right. You didn't have to always agree, but the whole the friendship was there. So you you became you first started your where did you have your first pro wrestling match? You remember was that up in Minnesota or up in Indiana, Indiana. Indianapolis? Indianapolis. Yeah. yeah. Well, was and that Crusher? My, my first match was Joe Blanchard. Joe Blanchard. <laughs> wow. And they they sent us twenty minutes Broadway. <laughs> I like to die. I hadn't even had a match yet, you know. Yeah. And then my, uh, I then I was there was a match in Portsmouth, Ohio, and I get a call from Art Nelson says, "Take your bag, kid, like you, because I know you're going to go watch the matches tonight. Because I'm not going to show up. They'll have to let you wrestle." Then it wasn't thirty minutes later. His partner, his tag partner, Stan called and said, and he stuttered. He said, "To take your bag, kid." They'll have to let you wrestle. I'm not going to show up. So they, they didn't show up. So we got there. So the promoter was going to put me a bit against Big Bill Miller in the main event. I, I'd had one match, <laughs> and I, and Bill said, "Don't worry." I said, "Yeah, I'm not." But about that, Bill, I just am afraid I'll let you down. And so they they changed it, but they put me with Dale. But they said you have to put him over. I said, "Hell, I did for two years at OU. This will be." <laughs> Guess what? When Dale told me it's time to get heat, I hit him as a tate. I knocked his tooth out. <laughs> oh golly! So anyway, and this and the Scott brothers, that Sandy Scott was the best river. He got yeah, he me. On, he got me one where I said, "Man, I was going to kill him," and he had to finally tell me it was a rib, you know. But they pulled some ribs on me. Oh my golly! What, was it? what what did you think when you first saw the business? When you first saw the matches? Because you didn't grow up a fan, but when you first the, saw you it, know, what did you the, think? I, at the Armory in Indianapolis, it changed for me when I saw Dick the Bruiser. The Bruiser came in. He was late, so nobody would seen him in the dressing room. But he came in and with all that energy he had, and he captivated that audience. And I think that's that and seeing some of the guys and meeting Dr. Bill Miller, who wrestled under a mask when he was playing football at Ohio State. He was making about 900 a 1000 a week while he was on a football scholarship because <laughs> he was wrestling, you know, and then Art Nelson and uh, the Scott brothers. 
uh, then I met Cowboy Bob Ellis, who was a big, big star, and he always wanted to ride with me, and he 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 treated me like a million bucks. And then Don Leo Jonathan, probably one of the greatest natural athletes I've ever seen, 308 pounds without an ounce of, ounce of fat. He could walk the top ring rope. He could do nip-ups. Unbelievable. They were just the talent. And then I'll never forget Art Nelson said, kid, this business is, it was in a depression. He said, the business is horrible. You can't make over 25,000 a year. Why are you with a college education? Why do you want to be in this business? And what he didn't realize, the 25,000 a year goes back to that economics professor that says, if you're making that, you're wealthy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so how, how did you, with Bob Ellis, uh, is that where you got the gimmick cowboy? Do you sell it from cowboy? No, Bob when, when, no, when I, uh, I wrestled in Joplin for Bob, Bob, uh, Clay, Bob, Bob Clay, and, uh, Joplin Bob Clay and, and Leonard Joplin. Clay, Bob and Leonard Clay. Yeah. And so while Red Berry was home, cause his wife did the census in, in Pittsburgh, Kansas or somewhere. And so he was home. And so he wanted to work the show. So they put me as his tag partner and we, and Bob, Ella, Bob Clay was so damn dumb. He wouldn't even put our TV show in Joplin. His whole promotion was on the six o'clock news the day of the show and newspaper. So he has Wild Red Berry and I out there and they, we had a little schmoz. I worked out something with, with one of the guys when they came on the deal, we had a little schmoz and Wild Red says, that's right, ladies and gentlemen, you come tonight. Me and Big Dick Watts are going to, he missed my name from Bill to Dick. <laughs> Big Dick Watts. So, when I went to the ring that night, there's these girls said, well, hello, Big Dick, <laughs> you know, which we know is an exaggeration. Well, he obviously didn't see you in the shower. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, it depends on how cold the water is. Yeah. So any, anyway, Wild Red went back and told Vince, and Toots and all of them get this kid. So I'm wrestling in Wichita Falls for Bob Clay again at the 4-H Bar and Arena that doesn't right. even have a phone. And the cops come to get me for an emergency call. And I'm afraid it's my parents. And it was Vince McMahon and Toots Mon. And they said, you're on television a week from today in Washington, D.C. And I said, well, I have to check with Leroy McGurk. They said, we'll take care of you. You just be here. But I had Leroy. Leroy said, no, you go. This is big time opportunity. And that's, so that's how I went back there. And then being from Oklahoma, naturally, as a cowboy, hell, I didn't even have a cowboy hat. I went to the Stetson factory in Philadelphia and bought a cowboy hat. Of course, we all had boots and jeans. Yeah. So I became Cowboy Bill Watts. So they take me to all these dude ranches to ride those damn horses, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but you're people, you're like you're like what 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 that guy and uh and uh blazing saddle the hell the only horse you didn't knock out the damn horse <laughs> yeah that was alex karras remember yeah, alex yeah. karras he got suspended for a year in the nfl for betting was you around was you around now are we going to get to that well I, I wasn't around him no but i i knew the story i'd seen him his rookie year because they came and worked out at oklahoma university for a week uh, so the uh, Detroit did. Right. So anyway, uh, that's how I got. That's how I got started as a cowboy, uh, and uh, I got over. And then Bruno San Martino and I became friends. And my I was my max about then was about five hundred on the bench press. Working out with San Martino, pretty soon I was doing five eighty five, and he was doing five eighty five. We were doing more than anybody in the world at that time but they wouldn't count it because we were pros. Uh, and and that was non-steroid. Neither one of us ever took steroid. And so not that I'm so good about it. If I'd have known what they would have done, yeah. I probably would have, but I didn't. And uh, San Martino, so we became, and San Martino was a fun guy. He, uh, like if I was, it was a double main event, say in Pittsburgh, well, really it was about San Martino. He's the one that drew all the money. But he would go ahead and, and tell Zacco, who made the payoffs, it was a true main event that I was in. So I would get good money too. So pretty soon he and I would go to settle up on our pay together. And we worked out some signs to where we skipped a lot of dates and told, and then we'd pick up this. 
So we, because we were both under contract <laughs> and I was the only guy that challenged their contract. <laughs> Vince had never had anybody challenge a contract. So here's what the deal. If I was wrestling, say Bobo, they'd pay Bobo $2,000 and pay me 4,000. Then I would kick back a thousand, but I still made a thousand more. But what it was for Vince was a way to steal money from his partner in the town. Wow. They were smooth. They were smooth. And, I, and, and we liked it yeah. because the you guys know, we, were still getting paid. <laughs> and and was it Toots that was Vince's partner at the time that he was? Well, he was money. And there was a Jewish guy, Herbie Freeman, in the office right. who was a tough old shooter, they said. Good guy. There was, they were good guys. And then the Phil, Phil Zacco promoted uh, Baltimore and another place. And then there was another older guy, Jewish guy. I can't think of his name, but he was a nice guy. They had some quality guys around them, but it just, well, you didn't, you learned. I'll never forget, I was, watch, I was watching a match in Washington, D.C. that Monsoon was in. And he took a hellacious bump and he hurt himself. And I heard Vince talking to me. He said, damn, he gets hurt a lot for a big guy. And I thought, gee whiz, that's, that's all they care, you know. But it's just a different world. Right. But, but, Vince, but Vince, when I became a promoter, he had such a classy way of handling things. Let's say I had Waldo Von Eric working for me. And he's ready for Waldo to come back in there. So he called me and said, Bill, Waldo and I, I'm going to have Waldo come in <coughs> in eight weeks, but I want to get some TV dates on. So we'd go over the TV dates and hell, I, one thing I knew, I couldn't make Waldo the amount of money he could make back East. And Waldo was my friend. I want him to come back too. He was a hell of a talent. And so I'd agree to everything. And Vince would say, you know, Bill, I always like doing business with you. You're such a businessman and you're so easy to do business. Why don't I give you an extra week on Andre the Giant? That's tough to take. Yeah. If the territory's ready. That's seven days of sellouts. Yeah. And that's how Vince would do it. Wow. And now Vince Jr., I, I worked for him for three months. I wanted to see what he was about. And I'm telling you, he is brilliant. He's a workaholic. He and I could book the way Eddie Graham and I could book because he had the same philosophy. You book out there to WrestleMania and then you decide the steps to get there, but you decide where you're going afterwards. And Eddie used to do that on the Bayfront. You know, he'd say, okay, you're getting the Bayfront up, but then you don't have anything to come back to Tampa Tuesday. So you, from now on, you plan on coming back to Tampa on the Tuesday as your target date. So Eddie had a way of teaching you but Vince had it inherently, and in he's he's an unbelievable booker. You know, do I like what all he's done? No. I, I think he hurt the business in a lot of ways. Matter of fact, he and I had a lot of frank discussions. I said, you know, if you're smart, you'd left a few businesses in the business to feed you. You learned so much from him, yeah. Yeah. You know, Bill, Bill, you had such a phenomenal run with, with – uh, with Bruno while you were in New York, but you suddenly left. I, and, and the legend has it, there was a big fight as you were leaving the garden, like a four or five guys trying to jump in. That's when the curb stomp was invented. I heard you, you <laughs> put a guy on the curb and stomped and broke his jaw, shattered his jaw or something. Turned out it was- That, was in, West, that was in West Hempstead. That uh, was where? West Hempstead, Long Island, the Long yeah. Island one. Yeah. Uh -huh. And and Stolen, Stolen was the office guy, Arnie, right? Yeah, Arnie, yeah. He was fucking the ticket taker that day, who he later who he later married. And so here I am. And when I come in, this old lady standing by the dressing room, and she spit in my face. So anyway, I go in there. So when Bruno and I are a match, the heat got up so much, the commission comes in and stops the match. So the lady is waiting on me by the dressing room door again. And there's this big old guy behind her. Well, when I'm fighting my way to the damn dressing room, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like Sting told me one time when I went, took over WCW, he said, Bill, the business has changed. I said, yeah, you guys have never had to fight your way to the ring or from the ring because nobody believes it. 
<laughs> but the bottom line is I'm there and there's this lady. No, she was behind the guy. And so the guy steps out to, to hit me and I kicked him in the solar plexus and caught him a forearm shiver across the nose and mouth with the same shot. And he flies back in the wall and squashes her. Uh -huh. So she's ambulanced out. He's ambulanced out. So I, they were going to switch the title to me. And then they, they, Vince came to me and said, Bill, I don't think we can because this lawsuit, blah, 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 blah. So they brought in Bill Miller to take my place and all this stuff. They hired a lawyer, or I hired a lawyer, to appear at my arraignment. And he wanted $750 in to go plead not guilty. Wow. I said, hell, I can plead that and save the money. <laughs> so I went and pled the not guilty. But I talked to the cops there and said, who's the best criminal lawyer in the town that does trial? And they told me, and that guy got intrigued with the case and took the case. So we had this giant case. And, and so uh, the recorder, I could see the recorder, court recorder and the judge were close. So I got word with the recorder and I took her out to dinner and I gave her some tender love and care. So she said good things to about the judge, to, to the judge. Bottom line is we get into this trial and all the cops talk about how this guy was out of his seat and he's been in trouble. The district attorney drops the case. Then he comes over and he asks me for an autograph. I said, screw you. Oh, and they, then there's a guy that wrestled at Syracuse that knew me from Oklahoma that was a writing for the local newspaper. So he wrote a favorable story. So I beat that lawsuit. But that, that was in West Hempstead and the guy, you know, yeah, the guy got hurt a little bit. <laughs> and the judge then called me back in her chamber. She said, you're a fine young man. I've heard nothing but good about you. <laughs> but the bottom line, she says, where did all that blood come from? And I said, ma'am, some of these people are so uncoordinated. They slip and they fall. And I said, things happen. I said, I don't know. Maybe he's sick too. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that was, was almost what... as bad as that deal in Sarasota. Remember, you, remember when I, uh, we were after those marks? After I'd come out of that trial in Sarasota, we're after those marks, and you come in behind, and you guys jumped me and ran me off, and then you all stretched them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, was that Sarasota or St. Pete? Sam, uh, Sam, Sarasota. <laughs> Gosh, Jerry, I don't remember. I, I don't know. It's, it was funny. I know the trial. You know yeah. the when I was wrestling, that old lady stabbed me with that fingernail file. And all I did was feel that thing cut me. And I reached back to get a hand and I got a hand. I didn't even see it. And I swung it. And the next thing I see is this old lady hit that concrete wall. <laughs> it looked like a bug on a windshield. And she's out. And I thought, oh, no. So anyway, I had to had them take pictures. And had the cops watch the pictures get taken. So we had the trial. The judge was smart enough that he held the trial in his chamber. We're around this big conference table. I've shaved the goatee. And I'm not wearing the cowboy hat. I, you know, but bottom line, I'm sitting right there in a, at the corner at the end, and the old lady's sitting right here, but she's got brain damage. And they want me to pay for her tender, loving care the rest of her life. And she's sitting there with a towel and slobbering into the towel, and her daughter's <laughs> translating. They'd ask a question and her, she could be, nah, 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 nah. and the daughter would say some BS deal. So, anyway, the whole thing about she's innocent, <laughs> never any problem. That, well, the cops all testified they had nothing but problems with her. And she had no right to be over by the dressing room. So, anyway, the judge finally says to her, Where's Cowboy Bill Watts? And then, then she, the daughter says, Well, he's not here. He said, no, ask her again, where's Cowboy Bill? He said, that's Cowboy Bill Watts sitting right there by you. And she looked at me and her eyes get up like it. And she reaches across and gets me by the throat. And I, I just grab her hand so they can't get away. And I'm slowly sliding under the table. And she's strangling me to death. And the judge threw the case out. <laughs>
And she had originally stabbed you with a nail file? Yeah. I got stabbed in Baltimore with a fountain pen by a lady 80 years old that goes to mass every day. And I was going to kick her in the middle of the next week. And I saw how old she was afraid I'd kill her. <laughs> Where'd she get you with the fountain pen? In the calf of my leg. <laughs> it left a little blue dot. <laughs> <Love Luna. laughs> was it was it as you were walking by is that how she got you no there was no barricade around the ring in those days we came up with the idea of bear putting the barricade around the ring to where we could have a disclaimer on the tickets that you know if you were inside that you had no right to be there it helped stop a lot of lawsuits where so where was that, was that? That, that was why he Jared? left New York was the lawsuit at, out of Hempstead, right? No, 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 I won the lawsuit. I ran, I got out of New York when my deal with Bruno was over. Why I stick around, I'd watch the pattern there. I didn't right. want to just be, you know, I wanted to be figured in something. Uh, I'll tell you what, the uh, I didn't ever realize I was going to be a promoter. A lot of the guys said they realized. I remember in Washington, D.C., the top heel would get one match with Bobo. And they put him over right in the middle. Well, I told Bobo we could get three matches out of him. So he, he listened. And Bobo liked me. And he said, okay, <clears throat> I'm going to call Benson here to talk to him about this. But Cowboy, he said, you know, I can never explain it. I'm going to call you in to explain it. And that's what he did. And then I explained the angle to Vince. And so then the Saturday, I was the first wrestler to, to cross over to mainstream media. The Saturday evening post said a guy named Myron Cope traveled with me for a week to do a story that they called the rich full life of a bad guy. And that was huge in the Saturday evening post. So Myron is with me and he wants to go into the ring with me to get the feeling. They had 40 cops and I'd said stuff on TV you could not say today. You better not even think it today. I was saying racial stuff. It was so horrible. So anyway, the place is packed. In my entryway, they put chicken wire up here so they couldn't throw anything. They peed in buckets and were <laughs> throwing pee on me. We get to the ring and Myron says, Bill, have the police take me to the dressing room. You're never going to get out of this alive. <laughs> and so I went over Bobo. They're coming in the ring, opening up knives to cut me. I look at the dressing room. The 40 cops have been eaten alive out there. I see Zacho the other way, and he's going this way, this way. Because they were expecting me to go back the way I'd come in. So I went that way. I had to, I had to do a little more than brush a few people. Matter of fact, 17 people went to the emergency room. <laughs> But the bottom line, I jumped the retaining wall, kicked the fire door, open, ran a mile, and called back for my, my clothes and my car. And uh, Zacho said, my God, you hit women and children? I said, Phil, <laughs> it was a riot. I didn't have time to check health cards and ID. <laughs> I said, how did you like my bank shots where I hit the one guy in his head and hit the guy behind him? I'd knock them both out. You know, I mean, I was so scared. You were hoping your mother would show up or a ladder would be there. If you've been in a riot where they're after you, that's totally out of control. They've overrun 40 cops. I'm going to tell you, it, 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 it'll give you a little tremble. So. And was that in DC with, uh, with Bobo? Yeah. And that's the summer that the equal rights amendment was signed. I were, I wrestled Bobo three times. I kept, that's where I come up with the, boxing headgear to protect myself and and then he strangled me and got disqualified on one on that so we got three matches that bobo loved me he told me one time he said cowboy we're in the shower so i bet i can screw better than you i'm looking at him i'm looking at me and i said well that's not really fair bo because i'd have to do it three times to get close to you one i said you know i just not endowed like that <laughs> I said, you know, with me, God grew a man. With you, they grew a big prick. <laughs> <laughs> but Bobo was a really good guy. Yeah, good. great guy. Yeah. yeah. And when did I you end up? 
Uh, During that time, you ended up going to Japan uh, for All Japan. Was that was Giant Baba already running the company then? No. No, Charlie Moto was uh, the guy that booked all the talent there, and he was a partner with LaBelle in L.A. And uh, you had uh, Anoki was on that group, and he was just getting started politically. Uh, I don't know, Jewel Strongbow probably had something to do with it, being he was the big partner in L.A. So that was before LaBelle, Jewel Strongbow. But uh, they had just made Bob a champion. And we went to Okinawa. And I was I was already PO uh, about lots of crappy things. And uh, they booked me in a, in a, in a no disqualification match, put all these things on where <clears throat> they only could be a finish. And I said, well, I guess you guys want a new champion. So why? I said, because I'm going to beat his ass and take his title. And I'm not coming back to drop it. So anyway, they gave me $1,300 to go eat lunch on. This was in the, this was in the 60s. That's a lot of money. So I'm trying to get the other guys to stand up for themselves. And they won't do it. So anyway, Charlie and them. Finally convinced me, well, this is our first time in Okinawa, blah, blah, blah. Bill, please. I said, all right. I'll put him over two straight. I'll get disqualified on the first one and let him, and then I'll get disqualified on the second one. <laughs> <laughs> I beat that poor Bob in half to death. <laughs> he was so scared. Then they had, they had another guy who was in Korea. They wanted me to stretch him, and I I just did it for honoriness. <laughs> I told, he used a headbutt, and I said, don't headbutt me unless I call for it. But he'd do it just out of the clear blue. So every time he did, I'd slap him. You could hear it going off now downtown. And then I picked him up, and I stampeded him into the side of the apron upside down. Got back in. I told the referee, I said, you can count to 60 if you want. 20 will just get it started. He ain't coming in. <laughs> so Dr. Death, when I sent him there, he come back, he said, Bill, they still call you the great Satan. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you see, I understand when they shake hands with you on a deal, that's just a negotiation. Doesn't mean their word is any good. It's just the beginning. So that helped me later when I was made a deal to supply them talent. You know, I had Jim Ross and <clears throat> came in, maybe it was Ken Mantell with me. They'd flown in from Tokyo and they come into Tulsa. And I said, let's go. I shut my briefcase. I mean, Jim Ross and Mantell, they, they were going crazy because they're thinking about all the money going down the drain. I said, I told you guys, let's go. They got up to leave too. They caught us at the elevator. And of course, the other guy sitting there, I recognized him from Japan. He was a professional interpreter. They understand English, believe you me. But they wanted to go through the interpreter so they can watch your reaction to what is being said. So he started interpreting for us. And that changed the deal dramatically because I knew the, I had them. You know, they made a long trip. They had to have something out of it. So, uh, and then I went over there for Turner Broadcasting. Of course, the one Japanese guy that I loved, that I got to know really well, was Hiro Matsuda. Yeah. And he was a class guy. His word was good. He was a stud. Uh, he was a fantastic human being. Did you and, meet Hiro here in Florida, or was, did you meet him over I met him in Oklahoma. Met him in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Oh, Leroy, you used to use him a lot, though. And then when I was doing uh, Atlanta in the in the guy in the Gunkle thing, I used to bring him in, and he would stay at my apartment with me because he was the best damn cook. Yeah. I mean, he, that sucker, he loved to cook and drink beer. I loved the guy. He was a, yeah. He so he was he was, was an awesome man there. Bill, Bill, you left you left New York, and uh, where did where did you end up after after New York? Was that when you went down to Georgia? 
Or no, no, you? no. Georgia was later. I went to uh, went home. Was working for Leroy, and then I went. I went to the West Coast for Shires, and for just six or eight weeks, then I was supposed to go to Japan. And I'll be damned at the Cow Palace. Shires switches the title to me. You know, Shires, you didn't know where you were with Shires. He didn't tell you anything until then, and he then he wanted to design your match or he wanted to design your interviews. He was a genius. But anyway, he switched the title to me, and, and it keeps it on me. And I kept saying, I finally said, Roy, I go to Japan in two weeks. You're not going to Japan. Gosh, damn, I got this title on you. <clears throat> so he worked out a change with Moto and them to keep me for a while. So, you know, it was a good run. I learned so much from Ray Steven. Yeah. Matter of fact, that's where Pat Patterson learned everything yeah. was Ray. Ray was the best worker in the business at the time. Was Ray, far, a good, was Ray a good uh, good finish man, too, at, at that time? Or who, Shires was pretty good. Right, Shires was oh. really good, yeah. What, uh, but Pat or uh, 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 Ray, was it? What, did, was he a good finisher or just he good? Didn't, he didn't, des he didn't design the finishes, and neither did Pat. Shires designed his own. Uh, Shires started letting me design them, which I didn't realize why. Charles and I came, became pretty close. And I told him that, Roy, you're going to burn yourself out because you want to tell every wrestler, every 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 high spot, the finish, and even how to do their interviews. So they're all become you. You got to let these guys create. And he took a note to that because he was a smart, smart guy. So I, I tell you one time I was in a match Jim Hady was my partner. Jim Hady was unbelievably good worker. It was against Pat and Ray in San Jose. Jerry, that match, the things they did were so awesome. I just, I, I should have had popcorn and been in the front row and just watch it. It was so wow. spectacular. And then they'd build the heat on Hady, he'd tag me. I'd come in and make a big comeback. Then Ray say, now get Haiti back in here before you kill us all. <laughs> and Haiti come back. But they did bumps and shit that should have killed an ordinary human. So after the match, Shire stops all four of us and takes us back behind stage and screamed at us for 30 minutes about what dumbasses we were. He said, I had Pepper Gomez, who looks like an old cunt. He said, I had him get counted out from a bump that you guys did bumps out there. They were 10 times better and you're up and still wrestling he said what you're doing you're killing the business if those bumps don't kill you you should be almost dead by some of them they're all finished moves and you guys are using them as high spots and he was right he was right then another thing he booked me once with Kenji Shibuya in Fresno and sent us an hour Broadway boy Jerry you know that was a mistake I'm not an hour man well, yeah, Kenji Shibuya wasn't and either. Then, and then Shibuya thought he was supposed to show that he could wrestle. My theory, if you're a baby face, you can wrestle and you can fight. If you're a heel, you can't beat the baby face wrestling and you can't beat him fighting. you got to heal. <laughs> That's where the heat comes in. So Shibuya wanted to show everybody he could wrestle. So he spent a lot of time on his face on the mat. Like about 25, 30 minutes of the hour. And Shires is screaming at me. I mean, uh, but yeah. I said, Roy, I told you, I'm not an hour man. You want a fucking hour Broadway? Book somebody that gives a shit. I'm not doing it. And tell that Shibuya that we can finish this any way he wants. But he just got a small taste of it. But tell him he's never going to score a wrestling move on me. And he's not going to outfight me. Yeah, you 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 were around a lot of great Finnish guys, and uh, some guy that I've never asked you this question before. But Shard, you, you you're so so into what Shard was telling you everything and describing his, his method. Eddie was a finished man too. How right, would you compare you, Shard Shard with Eddie? Well, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little because I went to see, I went to Ganya next. Ganya could see a big picture. He wasn't a great finish guy, but he could see the big picture. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference. He, There's a big difference in that too for for listeners out there. 
Well, what happened was I'm there about a year and all of a sudden he books me with him. And we're both baby faces. He's the champion, but we're both baby faces. And I said, Burden, this is your fucking ego. Because all your friends are telling you you can't beat me. And you can't. You can't beat a sooner, you Minnesota. Gopher. <laughs> I love it. And he was always wanting to work out, but I would never work out. I said, God, if I get in there, I'm not going to do like everybody else. I'm not going to put you over. I'm going to take your ass apart. And so he, now he wasn't afraid, but he just couldn't figure it. And then, of course, by then, the stories about some of my escapades and some of the street stuff, yeah. you know, where I bit the guy's ear off and eaten him, or the guy's eyeball came out. And, you know, who the hell wants to fight somebody like that? Right. I wouldn't. So anyway, uh, uh, Ganya, he said, no, he said, I'm even going to get the big place, the big hockey arena. He said, we're going to draw a lot of money. I said, I'm not going to put you over. I said, you egomaniac son of a bitch. I'm the one drawing the money while you're out, out there fishing and running around the country. You can step in and defend your title whenever you want, but it ain't going to be me. He said, I'll tell you what. You design us a program where we get two or three matches. And as long as you don't take the title, I'll let you design the program. Because I was leaving. I'd already given him my notice. And I said, fuck you, I ain't doing this. And me and him and Bruiser in Chicago said, boy, that watch is hard to get along with. So anyway, he, he said that he challenged me. So I designed the finishes. And we had three matches. Matter of fact, the funny thing is, his partner in Denver had only made it a one fall match and he's late getting there and he comes in, we're in the ring and he said, we, we're ready to go. I said, we can't burn. I said, this is not a two out of three. It's a one fall match. He's like, oh, it's a two out of three. Like every... I said, burn, I cut the promos. Look at the program. It's a one fall. No, nope, we're doing two out of three. I stampede in the first one. His partner comes in and gives me the title belt. He's laying there selling. All of a sudden, he's up and he's grabbing the title back. <laughs> Damn we promoter a, did him know. <laughs> that's right. So we had such a controversy, we got a couple more matches out of him. <laughs> but Gagne was a neat guy. I liked him. And I, I think what I did, Jerry, I studied those guys. And I absorbed them for what I liked and what I didn't like. So then when I was for Leroy, it's about my third year. And boy, you get bled out there because it's so treacherous. I had all these stooges against me and they'd go down and drink with him on a Sunday down there. And I'd have to come in off the road and meet him on a Sunday and do the booking. And then him and Dorothy would count how many times I wrestled the spoiler in Shreveport. I'm killing the town. We sold it out every single Monday for a year, sold out. And he says, I'm killing it. <laughs> so anyway, that's the crap you're going through. Uh, Eddie called. And they booked me on that one show in Atlanta. And then Eddie called back. Now, I know without a damn doubt, Jack was buzzing. Because he was really, Jack was his boy. He yeah. loved Jack. He loved tough guys. And Jack was his shooter because Jack had beat everybody down there. And so I just assumed that Jack said, you need to get Bill. So he gave me 10%, as you know, of Atlanta and the and the goal was to get me down and get 10% of Florida. So that's what happened. Well, with Eddie, all that I did in Atlanta. Uh, let's talk about Atlanta. The, the war was going on in Atlanta at that time. Right. 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 And in Leicester, the war was caused or accelerated because Buddy and Leicester exchanged stock. Buddy took Leicester stock in Florida. And Lester right. took Buddy's stuff. And, and the Gunkles hated Lester. They hated Buddy, too. But they really hated Lester. And, but anyway, Eddie told me to, to book the TVs. So I would come in on on whatever day that Macon ran. Tuesday. And I'd go up until, Tuesday, until TV, and then I'd go home after TV. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, then I caught Lester and Roy Lee stealing. And I called Eddie. I said, you remember you told me how honest they were? I got the bulletin for you. But the bottom line, Eddie's and my relationship grew because we discussed finishes and programs the entire time there. 
and he stimulated all that in them. And Eddie wasn't drinking then. Right. <clears throat> I told that's him why, that's what I was telling John earlier that you you got Eddie at probably Eddie's peak time and his mind and his, his health and well being there, which was perfect. And he said he said to me one time, he said, Well, you're a college guy. What are you doing here for me? He said, I never even finished high school. And I said, I came to get my PhD. <laughs> yeah. And you know, and Eddie, Eddie had a saying that was so needy. We'd finish booking. And he'd say, you know, cowboy, there's just you and me. And he said, I'm not, I'm just not too sure about you. And I love that saying. <laughs> I've used that on so many good friends. <laughs> but Eddie Graham, and he, he was so deep. And his finishes were so and so when you get into that mode, it becomes you. So my finishes got like that. And uh, it was a it was a trip. I'll never forget. Because you said, you know, there's a card like I had Florida loaded. You said that the other day. Well, it's, it's right. I went to Eddie a couple times with the with the, the armory. And I said, Eddie, from the third match on, they should be main events. I said, we got the talent that's out the world. They're all main eventers. He said, you're doing a great job, kid. Just keep doing it. <laughs> I was wanting some help. <laughs> I'm like, what do I do with all these great I mean, we, you were, you know how great the talent was yeah, yeah. and every, any one of them could be the only town I never could cook was Tallahassee, but all you needed was Colt and Jack yeah. and Tallahassee would sell out, you know, but Tallahassee was and Jacksonville too, was a funny town. Jacksonville Saturday was night. real hard. Yeah. Still is to this day, even for the big guys, it's, it's still a difficult town. Remember Miami though, we were selling that Miami. They were scalping tickets in Miami. And Eddie caught Dundee stealing. And they took photographs of the of the arena. <laughs> and and, and Dundee. remember, Dundee used when when we when we brought him up on that. He Dundee started changing the seating plan every week. That's right. Every week was a different seating plan. So you never could, you know, you go upstairs at the crow's nest up there, and you look down and you count the, the ringside rows and everything, and the chairs. Every week you go up there, it'd be a different configuration. So I, I always thought Louis was Louis Tillet was in on it with him. But I we did wrestled too. Bah- we wrestled in the Bahamas, and they ditched me for the settlement. Louis and <laughs> Louis and uh, whoever Lester, it was made the settlement. Lester, Lester Welch. Lester, <laughs> Lester got beat up in, in the Bahamas more than anybody I know. I got that. John, every time we'd have a big, huge house out there, uh, the the box office will get robbed or Lester <laughs> will get beat up on the way back to the airplane, right, Bill? <laughs> well, it's kind of like Bob Clay in Wichita Falls when he knew it was going to sell out. His wife was the ticket seller. Yeah. <laughs> so Lester yeah, Welch yeah. was pinching money in the Bahamas, and Dundee was allegedly or pinching money in behind Miami. Miami. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. But and we had you, Miami so hot. And I had Jackie Gleason's dressing room. We had so much fun. But then the only problem with Eddie was I wanted to hire my own assistant. And Eddie kept, kept saddling me with assistants. And, and then none of them could book. Uh, Frankie Kane, he couldn't book. Uh, but anyway. Eddie was paying back old favors, wasn't he? At that, at that well, point. you know, so funny. I, my first... My first deal down there was Dusty was going behind my back to Eddie. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Eddie really liked Dusty. And I, and I just said, Eddie, I got Dusty coming in. Dusty came in. And I went, handed him a book. I said, you're the new booker, you fat shit. He said, what? I said, you're going behind my back to Eddie. So either I'm firing you or you're the new booker. And Dusty looked at Eddie and Eddie said, well, they fire him. So that settled that one. <laughs> and I love Dusty. I love Dusty. Yeah. Although his ego, he couldn't stand for me to be around him when he wasn't working directly for me because he couldn't be SV. But I love the guy. Matter of fact, when I the part of the deal when I went to Turner Broadcasting was I fi- I could I fire Dusty? I said, sure. But I'm not gonna fire him just to fire him. So I went in to see Dusty when I first when I got there. And I said, here's the deal. But I said, I want your talent. 
but I'm the boss. If you can handle that, you stay, otherwise you're gone. And he stayed and he did his, and he was good. He was good. So I never had a, I love Dusty. It was easy to create for him. I was, when he did that interview in Tampa where he became the American dream. Son, son old Palmer, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, 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 Bill, Bill, you, you brought that up. Tell us, tell us the, the, the behind the scenes on on Dusty Turn and Face at, uh, and uh, here in Florida. There were the you know Jack was as hot as he could. Jack had lost the title. I think he'd come back, and they would kind of just just fill in time at, at at that moment. Well, you remember I put the I put the billboards up. Remember? Right. Yeah, the bill first billboards ever. I think in our city. All, all around, all around Tampa. Well, I, I thought it was Gary Hart and his army we turned him with. And yeah. When it packs on them. Packs on. Yeah. And remember, Dusty is I'm a son of a plumber. Right. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm a brown bag. I take my lunch in a brown bag. Yeah. And, and you know, when I got there, they had run the thing with Joe LaDuke and Dusty, the Texas Deathmatch, Canadian Lumberjack, Texas Deathmatch. They had done it to death. And the territory was flat. And when I turned, Joe Duke didn't want to stay, which is fine with me. But Dusty was who, who I knew had the talent, the charisma. And uh, and, we, and then we could start getting the other talent in. Uh, so that became the way we went. And and then, like I say, Jack was, was, was guilt edge there. <clears throat> the Buddy Fuller was the other right. one that started trying to be. He was bitching that I was making, paying the guys too much. I, Eddie made me in charge of everything. So I not only booked the cards, I made the payoffs. Right. And so Buddy Fuller said, and Eddie said, Buddy, our net bottom line is 10 times bigger than anything we've ever made with him. And I said, yeah, Buddy, what the hell have you ever done except bitch? I said, you know, if you want the booking job, that's fine. Take it. And he decided he liked a little brown paper bag better. You know, that, that, uh, but Buddy was a buddy I never trusted. Funny thing is, remember, uh, uh, the friend of Eddie's had Orlando, was that Monday? Milo. What, was it Monday's? Yeah, well, well, it was Monday, yeah. It was Monday I mean, along with West Palm. Beach. West Palm was Monday. Yeah. And remember, uh, uh, Ronald Fuller was retired. He was selling real estate. Right. Because nobody used him. Matt Suda, nobody used him. So I started taking the second team to West Palm and real easy the way I did it. I made up Mike Graham handle Orlando. Yeah, I remember that. I gave, I gave him percentage. <laughs> Didn't worry me because I knew one thing about it. Eddie's not going to let that flop. So Eddie was there every Monday. Mm -hmm. So we're shooting the hot angles. They're drawing the money, but Eddie's there to take care of things for Mike and with Mike. So it gave Mike a good place. <laughs> and I've always liked Mike. And Mike's got a good mind for the business. And Eddie, then I'd take the second team. So I get Ronald Fuller to come out of retirement. I get Matt Suda, give him a couple of wins off TV. Start shooting a few. Pretty soon, we're doing 25, 30 grand in West Palm. And we own the town. Yeah. All we're getting in Orlando is a booking fee. Right. <laughs> so... Milo was making a fortune. <laughs> so there were some things <clears throat> that you had to work around. But Eddie, Eddie was, you know, he came, he came back when I came home. He came to see me one time for about a week. And he wanted to talk about God. And we talked a lot about God. And we talked about Christ. And we talked about the Bible. And, you know, my life has not been a snapshot of what you would consider a, quote, stereotype Christian. It's been pretty mercurial. But the bottom line is God is faithful even when you aren't. And once you're saved, you're his. And he never lets go of you. You may leave, a, leave and leave a defeated Christian life. But he doesn't let go of you. And the Holy Spirit is constantly knocking on the door. And you may have your heart really calloused, but finally you start listening, and that's what happened to me. Have I sinned since? Why, yes. There's nobody that doesn't sin. There's nobody that can live 
the quote, perfect Christian life. Nobody. But you're covered because see, then it's not about your performance. It's about Christ's performance. Christ is the one that paid the price. He became my sin, your sin, your sin. And he went to, he went to eternal supernatural judgment. Matter of fact, if you look in the Bible, in the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in three of them, it talks about the, it going completely dark at the cross. Completely. I think that God, and when you read Isaiah about Christ's visage was marred more than that of any man, I said, what is that? There's people in, 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 in the Holocaust. There's people in train wrecks. There's people in fires. Their visage is marred. How could Christ have been worse? I know the crucifixion's horrible, but is it worse than that? And my little brother said, Bill, let's look at that. And he showed me those three, three gospel places. And I think maybe the supernatural judgment is what broke him, what marred his visions. And it was so bad that God didn't want his creation to see it. Mm -hmm. He created total darkness while Christ, Christ paid the price for all sin, present, past, and future. What a horrible thing he went through. And you know, there's yeah. been a couple of times yeah, no, that I was stressed to the max. I was going to kill some people one time that, had, that should be killed. And I was all ready to do it. And I sat down and explained it to God. It was like there was a presence listening to me. I didn't hear voices. I didn't hear anything. Just like this presence was listening to me. I wouldn't say anything. When I got through, it's like the presence said, now let's go back to the cross. And look at what I've done for you. Which one are you going to cling to? Put my gun away. I put my other things I had with me away. And I went to that meeting with six or seven lawyers and the IRS and my ex-wife. So I'm just telling you guys, and what I've been through with this COVID, the only thing I could cry out to sometimes was Christ. So anyway, uh, Eddie wanted to know, but it didn't get there. Yeah, He just no. couldn't, he couldn't get there. Well, what was the big difference between Roy and Eddie besides Roy getting in wrestler's face? Or what, Eddie never did that. I mean, Eddie was too polite sometimes, I think. To Roy? Roy Shars. Oh, Shars. His, his, his method of delivering a finish and, and Eddie's method. They were both geniuses in delivering yes. finishes. Well, okay. Eddie, Eddie had a, a way of doing it. And I know you know this, too. He would call you, and he would talk about something like it just just one of these <laughs> happenstance calls. Wow, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> pretty soon you're waiting to get to the meet because you know this call is more than just hello yeah. and hey, let's have a cup of coffee. I never forget when I was getting over when I turned heel in Florida. I I knew that I could sit there by Gordon and get over better than him working in the ring. When I really learned that, Jerry, was when I was working the Shires and we used to go into the, in the, to Hawaii to be at the HIC, the big show, because Shires uh, started partnering with, with, with uh, Blears and what's his name on the big show. And I watched their TV and they had an hour and a half and they do three matches in an hour and a half. The rest was all interviews. Right. And Johnny Barron had the whole country going crazy. When he had that deal inside the, the casket where he'd knock on the door and all of a sudden the casket door would open and Barron would be standing on his head smoking a cigar. And he'd get up and say these wild interviews or he'd do children's nursery rhymes and twist them. And and then and, and, and courtesy of Kea, he'd be sitting in the dressing room looking in the mirror and they'd film him from the back. And he'd be talking in the mirror and it was all about the personalities not the wrestling. And so I knew that. So I'm getting over with Soli. But Eddie called and he said, you know, Bill, what would you do if you were a guest on Johnny Carson's show and you took over the show and insulted him and everything else? 
what do you think would happen? I said, he probably kicked me off. And he said, do you think he'd invite you back? He said, no. He said, well, Gordon, to everybody in Florida is the host of our show. Now we know he works for us and you're his boss, but the people in Florida think he's the host of the show. Are you treating him like he's the host? But I got it. Yeah. And I Simple. did. Matter, matter of fact, I used to tell my guys, you don't get on Jim Ross. You don't get on Boyd Pierce. You know, they're not putting a fanny over 14 inches. You are. We keep it among the wrestling. And the same thing I told Jim Ross and Boyd Pierce was when you start talking about yourself, you'll no longer be here. It's all about the wrestlers. We keep it on the wrestlers. But that's how Eddie would do that. Mm -hmm. So if, a, if, if Dusty was needing to be babysat, Eddie'd meet the planes coming in. You know, and like I say, Dusty was guilty. As a matter of fact, Michelle was one of the best things that ever happened to Dusty. Right. Yeah. And I love the big guy. I, and, and I recognize. Oh, you did. Yeah. You're... I recognize the fact that, that you know, I, I had could dominate him in certain ways. But he was a talent. The problem with Dusty, he wouldn't follow things up. He'd get something hot going and get tired of it. And then it'd get, oops, 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 oops. How'd I do that? Are we still here? Yeah, we're still here. Yeah, you're here. <laughs> I don't know where the guilt, the guilt anyway, Dusty, uh, uh, I don't know. How to get back to it. you're okay we see you okay anyway you know dusty would would get tired of something or like they got into in the carolinas where they bought two airplanes why would you buy a six passenger jet yeah. in our business and i and i owned a phillips distributorship in in the aviation at, at riverside airport and i even told jimmy i said i can get you a discount on all the aviation gas and fuel you buy all around the country and he wouldn't even listen to that. So, so uh, <laughs> that was Dusty and Flair won't not do each other. Right, exactly. Okay, <laughs> Bill, uh, uh, Florida, Florida, you you pop Florida like crazy. Then then you you went home, right? Or yeah, you went, uh, you went home, and uh, you and Leroy kind of kind of explain to our our guests your relationship with Leroy and how how you ended up being the boss there. Well, Leroy, it was a long deal. Uh, first, Leroy called and asked me to come home. Then the next, that he would make a deal with me. Then the next deal was he didn't think I had enough experience, so he called Vernon and Fritz. So he gives them each 10%, and I think they were going to give me 5%. And I said, I'm not doing it. And I told Vern, I said, I'm not doing it. I'm done with you. I gave him my notes and I went on home and then I made my own deal with Leroy and uh, we finally negotiated it where I had a percentage that was I think 20% and Vernon and Fritz had 20 each and then Leroy had 40. No, Hodge had 10 and Leroy had 40 or 50, whatever. But anyway, and Vernon and Fritz were supposed to supply us talent. And they did a little bit, but not much. So the bottom line, I fought that thing. And the, like I say, the thing with Leroy, he was an alcoholic and he'd get to drinking and he'd get his cronies around him. And and he his MO was to keep people fighting each other and he would be able to stay in control. So he was doing that to me, creating all this stuff. So I had several at one time, I threw all his studios out of the office at once uh, yeah, I that was a boss full too. Huh? That was a boss full of students too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I threatened to beat the crap out of all of them. And, and you know, well, I had the first one I had a problem with was Donovan, Jan Dandy Jack Donovan. I designed the finish where he was getting beat, and he and his and Vern and I said Vern's not going to interfere in the match. If she does, I'll knock her out too. <laughs> and so. uh uh, anyway, I, then I gave him a minute. I went up to the office, and there he was with Leroy saying he wasn't going to do it. And I said, well, Jack, you're going to do a job tonight. You have a choice. You can do it down there in the ring as a work, 
or you can do it here in the office and it'll be a shoot. And I'm going to stomp your ass. So naturally, he decided to do it in the ring. Yeah. And uh, But anyway, I had this, this stuff with the Tretch and Bob Clay, Leonard Clay, Jack Dot, all of them, you know, Leo, oh, Leo, 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 Boss. Leo, Leo Boss was my guy. Oh. He saw the money he could make with me. And he didn't like any of them anyway. And so Leroy and then Dorothy and I mean, it was a mess. We every now and then we'd lose our building in Lafayette because she hadn't paid the electric and the water bill and stuff. You know, it's crazy. So we hired a secretary. And luckily, the secretary we got was the best person I ever had was Georgiana. And uh, they hated that, but she got the books in order and, and everything else. And I took Leroy to football games. I even let him bring his girlfriend and she could fly in my plane with him. I hope you, you didn't know. let him drive. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that was Murdoch. That was Murdoch. Murdoch got so, <laughs> Murdoch got so drunk, he had Leroy sitting behind the wheel and he was Murdoch steering for him. But anyway, <laughs> Leroy was a lot of things, but you, I just couldn't trust him. So the first thing I did, I quit paying Vernon Fritz and I upped mine and Leroy's salary, which Leroy would always go for. And I saved the I saved the money for Vernon Fritz in a special account. But they were so out of it, they didn't even know it. So we used that money to buy them out. And so in, in when we met in uh in in Vegas or Reno or wherever the one time that the NWA meeting was. Vegas. Uh, Vern said, well, why don't we just shoot for it? And he pulled his shirt off. Oh, no. He just pulled his shirt off, and I said, Vern, I didn't know you were going to give it to me. <laughs> and I took mine off, and he decided, oh, no, we can settle this. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, then he found out, and Fritz found out later that I'd paid them with their own money. And he said, is that true? And I said, yeah, you guys were the shits. You didn't do anything. Why should I give you any money? And so anyway, they found out that I'd paid them with their own money. <laughs> their own stock. <laughs> yeah, but the bottom line is, then when I came back from Eddie, uh, I had set a trap for Grizzly because he started letting Grizzly pay the boys again. And I knew Grizzly would be overdrawn. And then I was mad at him because he was supposed to be my guy keep an eye on things. So I booked myself with Grizzly for a week. And every night I stretched him. <laughs> and I knew how goosey he was. So I'd take him down, right. stick four fingers up his ass and grab my <laughs> knee. And, and watch him just jerk and jerk till he couldn't even get up. And I just told him, I said, that's the easy way. Next time you do that, I'll kill you. Hell, if I knew your fingers had been up Grizzly's ass, I wouldn't let you stick them down my throat. <laughs> well, you know, and I probably never washed all that time either. Oh, God. <laughs> well, I had to get you fired up when you'd come back, but I want to tell you, brother, when that would happen, you'd make the great one. I'd make a great comeback. I want you to, to, matter of fact, remember that night in Miami that I put Dusty over? Yeah. Then Mor Morocco came out. He beat the crap didn't you That's when Morocco out. tripped over the front top rope, jumping over the rope, getting ah. into you. He's going to be up the there, why? <laughs> and Dusty comes back. He says, Bill, get out of here. You're blowing off all your heat. I said, blowing off. Look at the crowd. We're about to have a riot. <laughs> what those guys didn't understand, I was still king of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, it was hilarious. But, yeah, I remember that stuff, trying to get you to fire up and go ahead and bow and you. When it I, was hard to fire up with 330 pounds laying all over your ass, John. It was just not hard. <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd either choke me, put his mouth like I used to do. You put his mouth <laughs> over my, my face where I couldn't breathe, and I'd have to fight like hell to get away. <laughs> I'm telling you, you have to. You guys, so you have to take in consideration the the uh, handicaps you had to work with. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Speaking of handicaps, now you're responsible for good old JR. Tell us the story <laughs> about how you. <laughs> what a segue. <laughs> Please edit that out, John. It'll never. <laughs> I'm not, no. no. <laughs> well, uh, you know, the uh, Jim wanted to be in the business worse than anything. 
So we hired him. We let him start putting up the ring. Then we made him a referee. And then while I was gone to, doing the Georgia thing and some stuff, <clears throat> he worked his way up a little with Leroy. But I'll tell you what Jim did. Jim was a, a radio salesman. So he understood demographics and how to study the charts as far as the numbers and stuff. So when I came back, he started educating me about that. And he has slowly coalesced. And he always had some good things to run. But what I would do, I, I started bringing together. My, I'd always have a booker. Then I'd have Jim Ross and maybe somebody else, maybe not, meet me to do the television. And we'd book around the TV. Uh, so those were sessions where you'd learn who, who had any real input and who didn't. And remember, I made Ernie Ladd the first black booker ever. And Ernie was one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. He was truly, truly an amazing guy. I loved him to death. He just, he had a lot of damn moral, ethical values as far as his word. If he gave you his word, it was good as gold. And uh, then Buck Robley, we had Buck. We did pretty good with Buck, but I rode hard on that. And then Buck started doing the junk and I fired him. And he was going to that had ass. to be hard because Buck Buck was really sharp when he was when he was straight, but when yeah, he but I'll tell you how sharp he was. He was going to trade the Freebirds for Stan and, and and the other guy, the blonde Hollywood blondes in Florida, and I said, "No, you're not." <laughs> you know, I wanted just to get the right setup there because I didn't want Michael in the ring, and that's when I got Buddy Roberts to go in the ring and Michael to because Michael is a great manager, but when he works, he does everything backwards. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, 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 but, but he has a good mind for the business. And the real guy that made that was Gordy. Bam, bam. He was unbelievable. Yeah, he was a mechanic. And, in and then Buddy Roberts could take a, he could take a great ass whipping from anybody. Yeah. So that all worked out good. And, uh, you know, you just, you learn. And then, uh, so then Buck, was going to whip my ass that night. I fired him in New Orleans. I said, Buck, you're getting fired tonight. You don't want to end up in the hospital too, do you? <laughs> you know, I said, there's no way. Anyway, he calmed down. He made $7,000 the last week he worked for me. Now that was back then. You know how much $7,000 is. I bet he never made that much money again. But uh, then I got, uh, like I said, I got Ernie. I, let, I tried Joe Hamilton for a short time. Jody was a great guy, but not a good booker. Yeah. The guy from Australia. Uh, Bill Dundee. Bill Dundee, yeah. I made more money with Bill Dundee than anybody, and I wouldn't let him wrestle. He wanted to wrestle so bad. I said, Dundee, if I wrestle, let you wrestle and Vince gives me the giant, you'll want to go over. <laughs> 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 so, so I, But Bill Dundee had more ideas. And you know what I've done? I'll tell you a quick story. Our business was flat. And I had DiBiase, I had Duggan, I had Dr. Death, I had uh, Hercules Hernandez. I had the toughest guys in the business. And our business is flat. So I called Jarrett and I asked him to fly into my TV and just look and see what he saw. Because I realized I was too deep in the forest to see the trees. So he came in, he and Lawler. And after, t after the TV shoot, he and I and Lawler and, and Jim Ross sat down and he said, and Lawler said, where's all the blowjobs? I said, well, you probably left your cousin at home. <laughs> you know, I said, you think I brought you here for that? And, the, and Jared said, no, but listen to us. You have the toughest wrestlers and your crowd is old. There's no young girls, no young guys. Where the young girls are, the young guys are. And so we worked out a talent switch and I, I went over to Memphis and he wanted to keep Jimmy Hart and he wanted to get rid of uh, Jim Cornette and Cornette didn't have a team, but we put a team together and then he gave me the rock and roll express because the blondes had just come in. So I had the hottest thing for the kids going with, the, with Cornette and the midnight express and the rock and roll express. You know, it was unreal. And we did the videos 
And, and I picked up the video idea from Jarrett. They were already doing those videos, even though I've lied my fanny off and told everybody I started it. I didn't. But the bottom line is the videos were great. Then we did our videos with, with uh, Magnum TA. We bought him clothes so he could wear the right clothes and all. And then uh, uh, Terry Taylor. And the thing, it just, and then what we just had to be was careful in how we booked them because, you know, they, they couldn't be against the big guys, couldn't overpower them. Right. Then uh, uh, we, then I was looking for a, a, the Black Star, and I love Thunderbolt Patterson personally, but he, but he's got too much baggage. And Ray Candy, I didn't think could make it. I tried with him. Tom Jones was a great guy, but again, he didn't, he didn't, at that point, wouldn't have done that what needed to be. So I got met with Ernie. And he was going to work for George Culkin, who was running opposition to us. And, and Grizzly Smith was there helping him book with the great Mephisto, Frankie Kane. And I wanted them to keep that. So they didn't realize I had Jack Curtis meet with Grizzly every Monday and give him an extra $300 for his kids. And that he had to stay. He had to stay in Mississippi and work for George. Because can you just see? Frankie Kane, the great Mephisto, and the big old giant grizzly. That yeah. match would be exciting, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I had them going, they were going down the tube. And and so anyway, I tried to get Ernie, but he'd given his word to George. But then he got over there and he said, he called me back, said, I've studied the map. There's no way I can make the money I need to make here. He said, I'll come to work for you. And I said, don't do any jobs on TV. He said, Bill, I can't do that. He said, it's, that's the way the business is. I'll put over whoever they want on TV. It won't affect anything. And that's what he did. Then he came in for me and we was putting him over, putting him over. <clears throat> and then he told me to put him in the ring with Ray Candy. And he was going to put Ray Candy over. I said, no, you're not. I'm getting you ready for me. He said, I'm taking Ray Candy. And that's what he did. And man, it clicked. It clicked. He knew his gimmick. And then I made him my booker. So then when I found JYD. How did you find JYD? That was Snake. Snake saw him in Calgary and told his dad. And his dad told me, and that's when, that was before Snake got so screwed up. He was a brilliant guy. He wasn't, a, wasn't so much a dressing room lawyer. And he wasn't on all the junk. And so we got JYD and gave him the name. His real name is Sylvester Ritter. We gave him the name and the gimmick and everything else. Then I sent him down. To, we were out in New Orleans, and I sent him down to St. Bernard for Ernie to, 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 to see what he could do. So Ernie called me. Ernie was harder on the black guys than anybody because he understood the opportunity and didn't want them to let themselves or any other black guy down. He wanted them to live up to it. And so uh, he said, well, he said, he can't handle it, boss. He said, he can't be our star. I said, what do you mean he can't be? Well, he said, I put him in there with Super Destroyer, sent him 20 minutes, his tongue was hanging out. He can't work. I said, you did what? You sent him 20 minutes Broadway with Super Destroyer? He said, yeah. I said, Ernie, you're fired. <laughs> I said, you are fired. I didn't send you down there. I sent him down there for you to find out what he could do not what he couldn't do. I know he can't work. Doesn't make any difference. It's a work. <clears throat> and so you're fired. And I hung up on him. And he called me back and we talked. And Ernie, bless his heart, when he finally understood where I was going, he said, case closed. <laughs> he said, case closed. And he starts chewing out Super Destroyer. <laughs> <laughs> and we jyd couldn't work i know but we had it but we would surround him with the right people he had the charisma he he had the charisma and ernie ladd would bring it up they'd make interviews that i'd say stop wait a minute you guys explain to me what you just said because you're talking ghetto ease you know, you know make sure and it was awesome I, 
I'll never forget they'd make those interviews about a stolen chain in the Pearl River and steal. Yeah. Whew, excuse Bless me. Bless you. So, so anyway, Ernie, and I want to tell you about Ernie. He fought stomach cancer for three years. And I know when he knew it was over, we talked. And and I said, well, big fella, I said, I'm a little upset that God's taking you home before me. He said, why? I said, because the way you eat, there'll be nothing left of my banquet when I get there. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, they thought of your banquet. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> well, you know, the greatest thing, Ernie and I and his wife, Roz, we went to the Superdome to see Ali take his title back from Sphinx. And so I picked up Rod and Ernie at the motel they were at. And I had one of those uh, budget uh, Lincoln town cars. And uh, he got in the back seat with her. And I said, Ernie, get up in the front seat. There's more room. And he put his arm around and said, Roz, he said, didn't I tell you when I met you that if you'd marry me, one of these days we'd have a big, fat, white, hunky chauffeur. <laughs> <laughs> He was, he was, and I'll tell you what, he, uh, he was a special guy and Roz is a special person. We stay in touch and, uh, bless her heart. She is a, they have a strong faith. Ernie was going one direction and God, God shook his tree and brother, he did a 180 and he lived it to the end. And so I'm Bill, so proud. Bill, you 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 created so many stars down there, but one star that that John John is really interested in, one star that you know that I, I really uh, became a friend of, and that's Doctor Death Steve Williams. I know you recruited him out. Oh, you had to go back to your school to find you a superstar. <laughs> there. How did how did all that come about? Did he approach you, or did you? How were you going? No, a Abel, Abel. Dan, okay. Dan and I, Stan was a senior when I was a sophomore at Putnam yeah. City. And we're still tight friends. Well, a good guy. Uh, Stan, is. Uh, Stan kept saying, we got a guy for you that'll fit, you know. And he was already Dr. Death from a, he'd had an injury in high school, so he'd worn a hockey mask when he was wrestling. And, uh, you know, I went down and watched him wrestle. Gosh, damn it, Gerald. He didn't use any technique. He just ate your lunch. That's yeah. all he'd do. Did you, know, you, he, you remember that riot he called at Gallagher Hall there in Stillwater when he when he sent that guy right? <laughs> the full scale riot happened at Gallagher Hall because of him. Well, you know he uh, the guy beat him was Bumgarner, but he Doc had hurt his sternum in the Nebraska game, so he couldn't even work out. All he could do was run. And remember, he beat uh, uh, the the last year's national champion, and then Bumgarner beat him. But uh, Doc was Doc was uh, so Stan was telling you about him, and so you went yeah. up to Norman. Yeah, and then and then uh, then uh, uh, Doc was like a kid in a lot of ways. He was easily influenced, but he was a good kid. Basically, he really was, and uh, I love the guy. Uh, he uh, he got in a, he got set up and got in a mess when he first got there. But thank God, one of the uh, judges in Baton Rouge was a Sooner, and was was <laughs> was a student coach when I was there, and I called him, and he went to bat for Doc with the judge that was going to sentence him, and that that went away. What, was thank he God. a willing Was he a willing guy when you said or when you approached him, hey Doc, I'd like you to be a pro, or did he know anything about our business? No, he wanted to be. He wanted to be. He wanted to be. Okay. Now here's a funny one: uh, the Road Warriors, which. I also designed their deal. Right. I flew over to Oli's TV. I'm the one who had them cut their hair and paint their faces. And so then we were running a show in Dallas and they were against Doc and somebody. And they'd gotten to the point where they didn't think they had to sell anybody. And they're telling me. And I said, I wouldn't have I were you guys. You guys are phenomenal. I said, by the way, I'm going to let Doc know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you always were a shit disturber, Bill. <laughs> hey, you had to work things out. You know, one thing about our place, you know, if you got in a fight in our dressing room, we did not stop it. Uh, I remember Tank, Tank, what's his name? Uh, made a, 
who? Patton. Was that his name? Yeah, Tag he Patton. Made, he, made a, he made a five minute promo about whipping Thunderbolt's ass in the dressing room in Baton Rouge. And then and then when he when he finally swung at Thunderbolt, Bolt took him down and beat the shit out of him. Yeah. Then Bolt was mad at me for letting it go. <laughs> I said, Bolt, it did you more good than anything. Yeah. You did okay. Yeah. And remember with the uh with the Butch Reed and the Barbarian, John Nord, I think. John in Nord. Oklahoma City. Brother, that was a classic. Wow. That was a I'm sitting there. And then Butch and Nord are going to square off. But then Nord says, well, I got, I feel like I got the flu or something this week. I'll do it next week. <laughs> and I said, oh, I said, oh, Butch, he, him, him hurting, him got temperature. He can't fight right now. <laughs> and Nord got up. He hit that reed. Gosh, damn, Gerald. You could hear that bone on bone. It back reed up a couple. And I mean, they hammered each other. And then that damn Butch reads, <laughs> he, he he's connected. Butch beats the crap out of him. Then he picks up a piece of PVC laying there. And I grabbed, I said, Butch, are you going to hurt him with PVC? Quit that. <clears throat> so remember, I used to do Oklahoma City on a Sunday afternoon in Tulsa, Sunday right. night. Well, guess what? I got them booked with each other in Tulsa, too. <laughs> so by the time they get home, their lips are swollen, the eyes are swollen. I called him in the hurricane room. I said, well, boys, this is, this match is booked here too. I said, so if you guys want to work, I, that's fine. Or if you want to shoot, it's fine. I said, we'll film it. And I'll play with myself as I watch it, but I'm not going to pay you any extra. Which way do you want to do it? And I said, let me tell you, Nord, you're still a rookie. If I were you, I'd let Reed run the match because otherwise he's going to whip your ass again and make you eat it. And so, but you all make up your mind and we got that handled, you know? So, so back, back to, uh, Dr. Death and the, uh, and the road warriors did they, they worked it out obviously. That oh night. yeah. Well, sure they did. <laughs> you remember I, I was telling you earlier about Stan Hansen and, and Frank Goodish. Right. They were a tag team. And Hodge and I are working out with working with them in Fort Smith. And it was Jimmy Lott's arena, so there wasn't much of a crowd there. And good about Jimmy think, Lott. Yeah, Goodish think, didn't think he should have to sell Hodge. And he showed me, he said, look at him and look at me. And he flexing for me. <laughs> and I said, gosh, damn, Frank, you're right. So I started Hodge with him in the match. But I had already buzzed in. Somehow Danny found out. <laughs> It's all mal. <laughs> and I mean, Danny took him down and stretched him and had him screaming and begging. <laughs> and finally, he let Danny let him tag Stan, and Stan comes in. Danny, Danny, I'm not part of this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, but all the time, all time, Goodies is screaming when he's looking over to me to help him. I said, Frank, show him your muscles. And I put my mouth. I said, remember, show him this. If you flex for it like you showed me, he'll be scared to death. <laughs> Bill, what made you want to paint the word warrior's face? What What did you see in that, or what did you see in, in culture that made you want to it, paint their face? It might have been one of the early Mel Gibson movies or something. I don't know what it was. But it just fit that these guys, you give them a way to step out a little bit, that they had, they, they had that charisma. Now, the bad thing is, I'll never forget with the younger one, or I don't know if he's younger, the, the 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 thinner one told me one time he was shooting straight monkey hormone, and every morning he woke woke up and wanted to kill somebody. And I said, "Boy, that's the way I'd want to live." <laughs> you know. So I, I, I was a tag team with Dick Murdoch when I first started. I'm good, really good friends with Michael Hayes for 30 years. Who who did you find more? between Dick Murdoch and Michael Hayes <laughs> in the in the territory. Oh, I didn't find Murdoch hardly ever. Murdoch Murdoch left Florida for me and came with me. And Murdoch was the best talent I had that could do the most and he and I could also work together against each other. Uh Dicky could do anything. He, he, he was awesome. I love Dickie. Yeah. I, I well, really let me, let me just tell you, one time 
we had a, a, a sleet storm and hit Tulsa. So guys are late getting in. The crowd is sparse. The midgets are there, and Murdoch decides he wants to he wants to referee their match. Uh. The Murdoch is the heel, and we're in a we're in a Texas death match as a main or something, and he's out there taking bumps for the midgets. <laughs> and I'm so damn mad I can't see straight. But I'll tell you what, he he worked with me and he did it. He turned it right around and he still had the heat. He was unreal. But here was my situation with Murdoch was with JYD. Because Dickie Murdoch was a racist. I mean, a complete, his thing was black and white. There was just no compromise. And I sat down with him. I said, Dickie, I love you. You've been the greatest thing. You've made the difference in my success here. And I need you. But I said, I also know you. And I know you can have a guy out there that thinks he's having a hell of a match because you're calling all these high spots and you're destroying them. I said, JYD is going to be my superstar because he's going to draw the blacks. He's going to make us all money. And he'll draw whites too. So if I catch you doing anything that takes away from him, I'll fire you on the spot. And that's, that was my little talk with Dickie. By the way, he came to see me before he died. And I love Dickie Burdock. He, he and Carl Cox, oh, that wow. was a pair. Yeah. Andre the Giant loved coming to work for me because he loved Murdoch because Murdoch could try to stay with him drinking, which is impossible. Yeah. So, do I? There's a, no. Bill, there's a legendary story about Dickie Murdoch. There's a legendary story about Dickie Murdoch and, and you, when you fly him one time. He said uh, uh, something that he, he, you gave him a check and it was it was off because you had fined him. Supposedly he never deposited a check, which I find hard to believe with Dickie Murdoch. And it messed up your accounting system so bad that you later went ahead and bonused him the money. Is there any? No, that? no, no. That's not true. Not now. No, that didn't ever happen. Uh, I don't remember ever finding it. The guy I find more than anybody was Buddy Landell. But Buddy Landell, when I'd find him, he knew he, he, that he, they were clear-cut policies. You had to be in the dressing room an hour ahead of the matches. You put away the cards and stuff and the dominoes an hour ahead of the matches. You know, the different things. And so Buddy Landell would work so hard, I'd end up bonusing him back what I'd find him. Yeah, that's and what I, I and, and, and depending on the guy's attitude, that's what I generally did. I wasn't after their money. Yeah. I was trying it, to get them to them a lesson. Yeah. yeah. Matter of fact, Paul Orndorff, who was getting mad every week, called me back a year after he left me and said, Bill, I just didn't realize all you were teaching me. So uh, some guys took it and could handle it, and some guys couldn't. But, uh, uh, you know, the, you have to. You have to have a system and you have to hold them accountable. I, you know, you can't accept the motel not waking them up and they miss their flight. You can't accept if they take the last plane and it's late. You, it's up to them to be there. <clears throat> so it, uh, there's, a lot that, there's a lot that was intended by that. But so, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a surprise because they all knew the rules. So how was Michael Hayes? <laughs> Michael Hayes. Because we, we had Michael in Texas. I love Michael. I just, when he was I there, he too. was wild. I think he's great. I love his mind. I think he's great. The, here was the only thing I said. He wanted to be in the ring to wrestle. And he did shit backwards. Bottom line, Buddy Roberts was a better worker and Buddy and Bam Bam fit because Buddy would let Bam Bam be the stud and Michael being the, the outside out of the ring guy, the manager, that got all the heat. But have Michael in there getting the shit whipped out of him and, and trying to do everything that Bam Bam did, that didn't help. So Buddy, Buddy Roberts, because he'd go out there and take an ass whipping from anybody and take the bumps and everything else. So it was a better thing for me and for box office, which Michael didn't like. But and I've told him that. I've told him that. I love the guy. I think he's a great guy. I, I respect him. I think 
you know, and I, he's certainly proven himself in the industry. Bill, what did you think when uh, during the time, say, 84 to 88, when WrestleMania starts, Starcade starts with Jim Crockett and Vince is starting to take over the world, uh, you know, with cable television now as national cable television. So somebody was going to do it. Did you think that there was a way to fight that tidal wave coming or did you see it coming? What was your thought? Vince would even tell you that every time he came against me, we kicked his ass. Uh, the, the business didn't beat me. It was the price of oil. We're in an oil state and oil dropped to $12 a barrel. The state was set up to break even at $20 a barrel. The oil states, all entertainment ceased. Your rock and roll, your country western bands quit touring Louisiana, Oklahoma, Texas. The hotels went broke, airlines went broke. It was unbelievable. It was something that unless you were there, you would not believe how that could affect you and the ancillary of all the all the businesses connected. So that's what happened with the business. Now, Vince told me that if WrestleMania 1 hadn't hit, he was broke. Plus, I understood his dad left him a million-dollar slush fund. So, you know, but the bottom line is I knew what they were going to do, plus – I also knew that they could buy my talent out from under me. So I had a choice. I could file the federal antitrust suit, which I probably should have. I just didn't want to, I didn't want to be there that much anymore. It was a time I decided it was good as any to get out. But, uh, and I flew up to see Vince to see if he would work something out. Uh, but he didn't want to, and I don't blame him. He was sitting with all the, all the cards. He had all the big population areas. But he almost went broke before he got it started. And as a matter of fact, the reason I worked for him for three months, he called me and he said, what would you think of a guy that grossed 85 million in this business last year and lost 5 million? I said, I'd say he's ate up in the gallop in case of the dumbass. He said, well, that's me. Would you come back here and work for three months? And I did. I was curious about him and I enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed. Matter of fact, I finally got on him and told him to quit being, listen to all the talent at each TV, just to be talent and let them be talent. And he stayed out of it and let me completely handle the TV as we was on the way home. He stopped the car and pulled over the side. I didn't know if we was going to fight or what. He grabbed me and hugged me and said, I've never seen TV like that. That was unbelievable. So he and I got along fine, except when he'd get on everybody, sometimes I would stand up for him. He got on everybody because they got him lost going on a trip. And I said, well, first of all, buy a fucking map. You know, I mean, or he got on us all about this. And I said, Vince, you can't blame us because we don't have the last say on what you air of the TV we shoot. You do all the editing. So, you know, he was, he was an interesting guy. I have nothing but respect for him. I, 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 I think he is creative. I think his work ethic is, he's, he's a, he's a monster. Uh, you know, he has stamina. He loves the business. He's, his problem is he has to have his hand on all of it. Well, then you've got to wait on him for everything. Did you think that any of the other guys had a chance against him, you know, for Crockett or of course, Eddie Pastor? No, Crockett's Eddie. problem was, here's Crockett's problem. Crockett couldn't book. So he had to have a booker. And he got Dusty. But Dusty is a is he, he could book certain things, but he couldn't juggle everything. So he would drop stuff or it would disappear when just about the time people were buying into it. Whereas with me, I wouldn't just go away from something because we had to think a little bit more about it. But why not? We had it. We had it established. Now, if we could bring it along and bring something else. So, you know, it was a different mindset on, 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 on how to keep things hot. Dusty could get things hot with himself. It's like me. When I was wrestling, I could always count on what I could do. But I didn't want to always wrestle. I wanted to have others. So I built Dick Murdoch. I'll never forget when I finally got Dick Murdoch past me. When I came out of the building in Shreveport, all the fans ran to get his autograph. <clears throat> then I had to talk to myself in the motel in the mirror. 
I said, all right, you egomaniac, calm down. You're not going to show him. You, you just got your first superstar. Now build another so he can't dictate to you. And that's how I realized it. That's what I started doing. I didn't have it all wrapped up in one guy. The reason JYD hurt us so bad is he walked out. Right. And Vince claimed he didn't pay him to do it. Between you and me, I I would not, I believe Vince paid him. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. It's in the past. But I believe he paid JYD. The bad thing is JYD got hooked on that crack cocaine and couldn't get off of it. Right. When 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 you went to a WCW, uh, I, I'm a real interested in this because Ron Simmons and I were tag team partners for many years, and Ron's best friend best friend I have. He's the best man at my wedding. When you put the title on Ron Simmons uh, that 1983 in Baltimore over Vader, he was recognized as the first uh, world heavyweight champion that, that was black. Did do you realize the historic significance? of what was going on at, at the time and was that part of the somebody had to do it ron was i think the right guy but was that part of the process for you as well well i knew what i needed and ron had all the credentials plus bobby bowden would make an interview for him you know i was looking for that next black star and i want to tell you i was also trying to prove a point to the boys in that match with how we worked it, people in the crowd were crying. We had the crowd like the old days. The crowd was into the whole thing. I mean, this thing hit them like a ton of bricks. So Ron was the guy I figured had the, he had the quality to be the person to carry the load. And, uh, and so, but that's what I was looking for. And, and that would be so important. The other thing is, it's so funny that everything they stopped me from doing, they let the next guy do. I wanted to put our nights, our TBS nights against Vince's pay-per-views. Knowing how important his pay-per-views would be for him and how good the ratings would be for us and how bad it would hurt him. They wouldn't let me because Turner had too many partners in the cable industry, he felt that it would hurt. But they did that with the next book. They did all the stuff they wouldn't let me do with the next book. But the bottom line is how much money the next booker lost. So that when Turner sold control, the bean counters looked at it and no more wrestling on TBS. Turner, hey. couldn't, Turner couldn't save it. Did you get any feedback from TBS, from the powers at TBS about putting the title on Ron? No. Matter of fact, I made I made the black lady the, the office manager. Not because she's black, because she knew more about everything going on than anybody. We had enough deadheads. We didn't get the best TV equipment. We didn't get a lot of stuff, you know. And I would hold a meeting after the TV shoots to criticize the shoot and they didn't like that there's a lot of things they didn't like and isn't it funny i wanted to turn rick steiner's brother heel and he wouldn't do it he's a better heel than a baby face it's a, just, just a lot of stuff uh <clears throat> what was the guy that was sting's partner in the gymnasium well helwig uh warrior that no one. no no yeah that one but in Atlanta. Oh, Lex Luger. Luger. Luger told me I helped him and told him how to settle the lawsuit with Turner Broadcasting when he was not working for me and never was. And I also helped Terry Funk settle his deal and then Terry stiffed me on the pay-per-view and didn't show up. <laughs> Yet I've you talked can't to trust Terry the Texan. Terry. I've talked to Terry a couple of times where he is, he's got dementia and he appreciates so much when you call him, you know, you just, at a certain point, all this is in the past. You know, I, would I forget it? No. Let me tell you, Eddie Graham back the funk boys when the old man died. Otherwise they'd have lost their deal in Japan. 
And I said, Eddie, why are you doing that? He said, because of the history. So, you know, matter of fact, one thing when, 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 when they were getting ready for Jack to take the title, they, they had Jack booked against Dory Sr. <clears throat> and he kind of went out there and hedged on the match where he didn't give Jack as much as he should have or done it the way he should have. But, but Eddie had them shooting the match on film. And after he got through editing it, it looked just like it ought to be. And he sent a copy to see Dory and said, thank you for the job you did for Jack. Here's how it played on TV. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. That's a great story there. I didn't know that. You know, and Dickie Slater, Dickie Slater was such a trip. And I said, Dickie, my problem with you is you've become Dor uh, Terry Funk. I don't, one cartoon in the business is enough. You know, Terry's gotten where he's a cartoon. I thought that Junior was a great champ. Uh, I remember Jack telling me that some of the hour Broadways they go said he'd kick it in gear that last 10 minutes. It was unreal. You know, it's just amazing. But, but what matches they were. What matches they were. Bill, now, now that you've uh, kind of uh, retired, uh, do you look back now and do you miss it? Uh, let me just say this, that my problem with my faith is I sometimes want to straddle. I want one foot in the world and one foot in my faith. If I'm in the wrestling business, it's the world. And there's some things that this, I, I'm thankful for the peace I have now. I'm thankful that the temptations of my flesh don't, are not where they affect me anymore. Uh, I, you know, my my business was, was, was a wonderful, fantastic, I'd say for a hedonist, it's the greatest business in the world. It's not the greatest business in the world for a family. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think when I got out, I was getting to the point where Eddie was. Eddie was burned out. And Eddie could no longer book. He could do it, but he couldn't do it consistently anymore. It eats your lunch. I figure a, book, a good booker running the territory and keeping it wide open, you got about a year. That's why when I came back, I started having meetings and I would form a little booking committee because you take a little from this, take a little from that, and you can put it together. I always had a sense of what would draw, and I would refine it. You know, the difference, say, between Dusty and I on the, on the blinding is I couldn't let the, I couldn't let the Freebirds just blind Junkyard Dog. It had to be an accident on purpose. Otherwise, if we as the promotion allowed them to get away with that, what would stop them from killing somebody? Other, as the promotion, we had to try to maintain some semblance of accountability. So the difference was when they blinded JYD, they could claim it was an accident when everybody knew it wasn't. Right. But I'd gotten that angle from Dusty. What my I didn't originate the story. I just did it better. Yeah. What a great career. I mean, do you look back now and think you're just I, sometimes I do. I look back and I think I'm a small kid from a small town and traveled all over the world. You look back now and go, that was some really cool stuff. There were so many great things in life. We get going and Gerald and there's so many things that we the stories. You know, I could go a ton of stories about Jack, stories about Jack and Hodge, all these different things. I mean, stories about Danny Hodge and some of the stuff he would pull that just no other human could pull because I never saw anybody that could touch Danny Hodge. I never saw anybody that could touch him. He was unbelievable. And he never got tired either. Uh, he and Matt Suda used to have 90 minute matches, you know, and stuff like that. And I mean, Danny, and yet, in some ways, Danny was, it was just, it was, you had to, it was a careful situation. 
but uh, there was there he was an unbelievable, unbelievable. You know, he in his uh, senior year, he didn't even have a point scored against him. Nobody scored a point, and he pinned everybody in the national tournament. Pinned everybody during the season, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't know he did that, but I know. Yeah, I yeah, he put, pinned everybody during the season too. Yeah. Wow. He was unreal. Boy, the guy that's at Penn State had four years, but when Danny wrestled, you could only do three. Right. And, and he was to Olympics twice. Then he took the Golden Glove Championship in New York, and nobody taught him how to box. They completely screwed him. But he was so tough. But he was a nice guy. Danny was a nice guy. Danny wouldn't cheat. He, he believed in his talent. Jack no, he cheated. He cheated on that golf course. I tell you that. <laughs> well, there you go. There you go. What well, Jack's another one. Jack had so much talent. I remember always being surprised at how strong Jack was. You know, he was. He was just Jack was. Strong. Remember the night Gerald? I caught him and I took him down. I thought if I could break him down and ride him, I'll give him a hard. Time. Shit, he hit that set outs quick. I mean, he flew out of there. Yeah, <laughs> he was something. <laughs> It was something. He, now, I, tell that, tell it, John about that. What you guys you used to let me come in and uh, and take you down all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wouldn't let Jack. And then I had set up with Gerald. And Gerald come in and shoot, take down, take me down. And I'd say, "You can't do that again." <laughs> and he did it two or three times. Then you get Jack in here, and that Jack, so he already knows that there's some shit going on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we we pulled some stuff. Yeah. The great one was that Indian headdress too. That cost me. I think I spent a couple of hundred dollars on that headdress. Yeah, that was a cheap one too. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, oh, Bill, we got we got to leave on a, on a great story here. Uh, you, me, Gordon, and Dusty, and we Jim Barnett on Atlanta after we set the record at the Omni riding around Atlanta one night. We're bored. What are we going to do? Let's go to the Barnett's house. You remember oh, that? God. We were so we were so inebriated, <laughs> and we were on that damn beltway forever. We had to feed. Was it your fish or Jack's fish? So I we went remember. by, and I thought Jack's wife was going to run her car into us. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right, Dusty conned him away by the by the guard. And as we went into Barnett's place, somebody was going out the other door. Yeah, <laughs> that Barnett was flustered. <laughs> How'd you get in? That dusty sweet talk, that guy. That was quite a night. I could, what I kept wondering, I didn't have to do TV the next day, and all you guys did. At and 7 a.m. Gordon, <laughs> Gordon Soley was so drunk, he could, he just sat there with his mouth open. <laughs> <laughs> guys, we're gonna get fired if we do this. Guys, we're gonna get fired if we do this. They go fire us, man. We're, we're all of it. <laughs> That's right. That's, that Barnett, you remember? Remember, I barred Barnett. Barnett told my children that I was uh, uh, what's the word when you're when you're uh, anti-homosexual, uh, oh, homophobic. Well, homophobic means you fear something. And I called Barnett and said, "Jim, I don't fear you. I just don't like what you do, but that's your business." And I banned him from his own office in Atlanta for a week. Yeah. <laughs> and I told Bobby if he removed my sign on the window, I'd fly back there and break his legs. <laughs> so Jim is calling Eddie every day. Oh, Eddie, Eddie, I can't even go to my own office. Finally, Eddie calls me. And he starts a you know, conversation about something. Then he gets around to Jim. He said, my gosh, Bill, he's got to be able to get in the office to do the paperwork and make the payoffs. And everything else. <laughs> a wild time back there, my brand. <laughs> we went through a lot. I ran into Larry Gatlin one night on an airplane out of Little Rock, and he was talking about Jim Barnett when he was down at the University of Texas. So there was a that Barnett did a lot of things in a lot of places. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bill, we, we've taken up a lot of your time. Man, it, it's been great revisiting an old friend here, I mean. 
you know, he, uh, I've always looked at you as, as sort of a, a big brother in this business because, you know, I, we go back to damn far there. But, uh, yeah. man, yeah. it's been a pleasure sitting here and revisiting in the old school days and, and what, what you've accomplished uh, in this business. And you're, you're, you're a true legend there. Well, you know that, by the way, on the original Hall of Fame in Stillwater, I was on the original Board of Governors with Roderick. Well, Roderick. Roderick, Roderick recruited me knowing that it needed people from everywhere and Abel would get mad. And I said, Stan, the hall of fame is bigger than OU and OSU. The fact that they're smart enough to have done it. That's, a, that's, that's up to them, but they did it. And I said, to me, it's bigger than one school, but, uh, Roderick was quite a guy, wasn't he? Oh, you know, Marn, Marn was, you know, Marn was another hero. Uh, John, he was he was our coach at OSU. He came right out of the Olympic championship and took over as head coach at Oklahoma State, won a national championship his first year as head coach. There. They went on and went about 10 more of them. But uh, yeah. what a coach and what a person. And somebody, you know, in the wrestling business, which back in those days looked at pro wrestling kind of kind of off, you know, like it's not real and not, not part of uh, the the – the, the culture of the country, but Marn was totally different. Marn used pro wrestling to recruit guys. So uh, yeah. he, he was, he was a super guy and had super respect for our business. Another guy that I always respect. Whatever happened to that Joe James? Joe, you know, that, that uh, I got an email from Leroy Smith, you know, Leroy, John, John's brother, Leroy, yeah. Le, Leroy sent me an email from, from a reporter in Chicago that was wanting uh, to interview uh, Joe James. So, Leroy sent me the email and said, can you help with this? I said, I hadn't seen uh, Joe in I I sent years. So Tadaki Hada, you know, one of the Hada brothers, uh, I called Tadaki. He said, I saw Joe at a tournament. He was leaving the tournament. I hollered at him. Joe just looked at me and waved and turned around and disappeared in the crowd. He said he wouldn't talk to anybody. So Joe just became a recluse. He was a policeman there on the docks there in Chicago, but he just kind of disappeared off the face of the earth. I don't know. Oh, he, was, he was a stud.